with that, over to you, Mr. Nick. Thank you very much. Well, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, everyone, or good midnight, if anyone's mad and dialing in from somewhere in a really weird time zone. Um, so this is the Binutils Boff. It's not really a presentation. It's more of a, a, a chance for all of us to talk about the Binutils, what we want it to do, what we want it to be, um, the future, basically, of the Binutils. Um, I have got a couple of suggestions for things we can talk about uh, just to get us started, but I'm hoping that um, people will chime in with their own concerns and their own questions. So if we have a look at this, so the first one that was on my mind was gold. What do we want to do with gold? Um, it's suffering from bit rot, I feel. It's, 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 Carry is maintaining it, but he's on, on his own and it's just, it's, it's not getting a, a lot of love. Do we want to keep it going? Um, as a matter of interest, is there anybody here who actually uses gold in their day to day work? Raise your hand in your, your emote um, um, settings. You can, so ben? On the, the National Labs, um, people were like depressed about um, gold going away because uh, their codes are extremely large and mm -hmm. the uh, and it takes forever to uh, to link them um, with Benitels. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. um, Jeff pointed me towards um, LLD, B? B? Yep. and yep. I haven't quite gotten them converted over yet. But link times are becoming a a big issue around here. Do Do you feel that converting over to LLD will solve that problem? To be very honest, I don't know if I have enough information to be able okay. to answer that effectively yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, um, okay. Okay. I think Facebook is in the same boat as Ben has just described. Um, that we certainly used to use gold, but I, and I think we still do, but playing with LLD, but I'm not quite sure of the details. But uh, LLD doesn't doesn't support linker plugins. It might, yeah. Thank you, Jacob. I will raise this issue, Nick, with people that I can. Okay. Uh, the other issue is that LLD doesn't support uh, relaxation, which for some architectures will be a problem. All right, so I'm, I'm getting the impression then that gold is still a useful tool for people and that we should be looking towards supporting it better rather than deprecating it. Do, did, uh, Nick, did you see what Peter posted on the, on the chat, the kernel blacklist gold? Hang on, I'm scrolling too far. Oh, blacklisted gold. Okay. Um, Peter, why did the kernel blacklist gold? Okay, well, well, we'll carry on then. Um, oh, mm. due to audio feedback. Oh, great. Uh, right. Well, okay. Well, someone else talk for a second while I try and put a headphone on. Let's see if this will work. I, I, I note that where I've seen complaints about gold, it's generally been it's been from projects that use that use incredibly complicated linker scripts, at which gold does not support in precisely the same. To, uh, supporting exactly the same linker script in both cases and yielding identical output seems a little utopian to me. Yeah, so the problem with the kernel is that the linker scripts went off and, and there were uh, a bunch of workarounds and at some point we just gave up because the binutils people, which would be you guys, um, said they weren't interested in fixing it. So we, we blacklisted gold and, and gave up on it. Right. I think that's the, the, the big issue I have is that um, there aren't enough of us who are interested in maintaining it to make it a, a viable um, program to make to keep going. If, if we want gold to carry on, we need to get more people working on it. So um, the one thing I'll say is we're not particularly tied to gold. The problem is arguably parallel linking. Um, we've got um, our computers are starting to get huge numbers of cores, but they aren't very fast cores. And the amount of um, the 
And so the, the size of our applications grow, gets bigger and it's just killing us. Well, I guess the question is there whether there's any chance of uh, bringing any of those improvements into Binutil's LD proper, or is it, is it crusted over enough that, that any sort of parallelization is not worth trying? Um, I, I don't know, I'm sure that has been the conclusion of other folks in the past, but, but is that still the consensus? I think it probably is. I've, I've always wondered whether um, something like the Elf Utils might decide to make their own linker based on their sources. It used to have one. Yeah. It was rot. It rotted. Sorry. Yeah. Well, and it, it, it only worked for x86, so yeah. I think the problem with how hoping for another new project that does one thing well is that it will do that one thing well, and it will not be a suitable replacement for all the other uses. It, and the gold was maybe our best hope at doing everything well, but 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 see what happened to even it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if yet another new linker project is uh, well advised just because of this uh, missing facility. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Yes, and, and that's one one thing. When um, Ian wrote that lovely um, blog uh, blog post series on the on the construction of gold, he did note that in some respects LD's architecture is kind of inside out for um, for, for Elf. Is it wise to drop uh, the project which is designed to have the architecture which isn't inside out in favour of the one which is? <laughs> Um, probably not. <laughs> um, it, it, um, the impression I'm getting is that what we need to do is in, invest more resources in gold to start um, fixing the bugs that are outstanding and um, the features that are missing. Uh, sorry, I just jumped in from another meeting real quick, but um, I think from Google's perspective, I, I don't really see anyone continuing to invest in gold. I think we've moved a lot of our development resources over to LLD. Um, Pixel 3 shipped not too long ago with a gold-linked kernel, um, but that was in the process of um, enabling LTO. And I think for now, uh, we're pretty happy with the architecture of LLD kind of thing. So, uh, you know, I, I was very disappointed to see gold get blacklisted by kernel developers. You know, I, I would like to try to support um, as many tools as possible, but without having a consumer on the kernel side, I, I kind of worry now who else is, is really using gold or really is, uh, cares about it, is maintaining it? Well, I'm, from the kernel's point of view, it's very easy. If there is someone who's interested enough to fix all the bugs, we can unlist it. I mean, it's only blacklisted because the bin utils people explicitly said they were not interested in fixing the bugs. Chicken and egg and chicken and egg. There you go, as usual. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, let's move on then. Here's another thing to think about. Automatically generating change logs. Um, so it's done in GCC. I think I'm right in saying that GDB doesn't do it. Um, but there's been some posts saying, hey, why don't we? Well, um, eh, I'm not a fan myself, but maybe other people are. Does anyone want to comment? Die, nope. die, as, a, as a relatively... As a relatively new contributor, um, I might note that while writing the change logs is a bit of a drag, um, but, it, but, but it does it does help to a degree because it forces you to read your dips before you commit. Um, having to paste the change logs in two places is a complete drag, um, and it screws up rebasing, and it screws and it screws up all sorts of things, and it needs all sorts of extra help. Honestly. Whether they're auto-generated or not, they should be. They, they, their management after they've been written should be more automated. There's, there are at least two tools to do it, um, and they work in opposite in opposite ways. Something should be, if not standardised, at least um, used used more widely. They are annoying. They are a, a slight burden in that respect. Um, having as GCC has just moved to. Uh, not maintaining them change log manually, it's actually quite nice because you don't get collisions. Uh, you have to write a change log still and stick it in the git commit and there are scripts that check that you actually wrote one that mentioned the right things it expects. Um, so that's quite nice. 
that, that, that was what I wanted to say. The way TC does it is excellent. You just write it in your commit methods and it takes care of files. Is it possible for it to be optional rather than compulsory? No, I don't believe so, because then the automation wouldn't work. Yeah, I believe it's compulsory on things like the release branches and trunk, but on your own branches, you don't have to do it. I mean, the, the, the largest single annoyance with change logs is if you're doing a large scale refactoring that causes small, boring changes to lots of functions, you have to name all the functions one by one. And frankly, in that case, what matters is the large scale nature of the large scale refactoring. Uh, if, it's a, if it's a change which has invasive changes to several functions, change logs are valuable. But if you're changing 200 functions in one go, it just becomes a pile of No one's ever going, ever going to read those. I think there are some functions, some changes that would benefit from change logs and some that wouldn't. Yeah, but I, I think that's a, di that's a different topic, right? I mean, one thing is if we want something that will write the change log entries for us like the glibc people are doing now right and on the other side there is the question whether we want to avoid having to merge the change logs because they always get in the way right every time that you do a cherry pick or merge or whatever so as for me i actually don't mind writing change log entries but i would really like to see um in Binuted something like what is done in gcc that for sure it would be very nice Nick, Nick has it right in that it is the engineering discipline that matters. And having in my time spent far too much time untangling 10 year old code, why do the canoe change logs save you? Um, well disciplined change logging. There are some subtleties I disagree with about the change log protocol, um, but broadly it's about as good as you get. And boy, does it help when you're 10 years down the line. The other thing is, do we have to, if we do make a change, do we have to coordinate with GDB as well? Does it have to be both projects at the same time? I, I think it's, it's actually possible to, to do it only in selected, uh, selected parts of the tree. Uh, already uh, the GCC scripts have a way to, to say that uh, no change logs uh, entries are mandatory in the git commit logs for some subdirectories which are maintained from elsewhere and so and the script which which creates the change log uh, updates can be also taught to handle separate directories so it can yeah it can be decided independently okay that's good all right but the gdb guys might like it anyway well, yes, they might, but I don't know. Any GDB people here want to speak up on this? Okay, well, let's move on to the next Andrew, topic. Then. Andrew Burgess couldn't get a, uh, a ticket, but I know he would be a huge supporter. All right. Okay, so next, next possible um, idea, closer ties with LLD. Um, I think it would be really nice, if, for example, if Binutils can run the LLD test suite and LLD could run the Binutils test suites or without having to do any hand waving and, and special scripts or anything like that. Um, another nice thing would be if, if the command lines were compatible so that users didn't have to worry which linker was actually running underneath. They just get, give the same command lines and it works. Um, but is that, is that a good idea or should we try and keep ourselves separate? What do you think? Nobody has anything to say. All right. Command line uh, compatibility certainly, ma certainly matters. I actually think that being compatible is in everybody's best interest because changing options in linker script syntax, who, why would you want to do that? That doesn't make it, it, it doesn't make sense. So I think compatibility is good. And I also think that I actually was under the impression that LLD was trying to be compatible with LD. And so is there really a huge disconnect between how much compatibility there is? No, there's not a huge disconnect. There is some. 
Uh, well, for, for some options, it just parses the option and does nothing with it. And for some option that's that's tolerable, but for for some options that change the behavior significantly, might be less so. Yeah, I, I suspect that you can't expect 100% compatibility either way because it will uh, lock both projects into a stagnation. It'll make it very difficult to add a feature to one without then also having to add it to the second one, which kind of defeats the purpose of having two separate projects. So. I suspect you could go overboard with that, although uh, with respect to, you know, linker script file format, sure, but something like command line option, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I, I certainly think uh, compatibility is in everyone's best interest. I think one of the things I'd be curious about is, you know, maybe on the LLD side, if we're looking to implement a new feature, um, is there some way that we could collaborate and post like, you know, here's how, what we're thinking of in the design. Is there any feedback um, that would maybe improve the design in a way that would make it easier to stay compatible between all, all the different projects. Maybe we could have a shared mailing list. I really like that idea. And I was going to propose that for, um, at least on the kernel side, when kernel developers are looking for some feature in various parts of the tools, you know, is it more specific to the kernel or not? Uh, I guess my interests are solely with the kernel, but it doesn't necessarily have to be a kernel-specific mailing list, I would say. Uh, I'm, I'm working on okay, I'm working on a good linker uh, feature request by the kernel developer. So they are testing the change now. I don't know if, there, if that works for kernel or not. So there's another thing. Um, that's uh, that's possibility would be added to LD. Yeah, so do we want to list such a mailing list in the maintainers tree for, for the kernel so that the kernel people can find you guys? Yeah, we can we can add that. I think that's a good idea. I'd support that would be great. Then we should make that happen. All right, well, we can talk offline about it then. Um, that was the only ideas that I had off the top of my head, but this is an opportunity for other people to speak up about things that they're concerned about or want to say. Anybody out there have questions for the bin utils or ideas? Is there any realistic chance to get CGEN integrated in bin utils? Jose, get out of my head. That's exactly what I was going to talk about. <laughs> <Jeez>. <laughs> well, I don't know what's stopping us. Uh, the, 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 I think the only complication like, that obviously comes to mind is, uh, is copyright assignment. The CGEN code is, is copyright assigned by, uh, listed as copyright holders as, as numerous separate individuals. It's not an FSF copyright uh, uh, sign over kind of package. Uh, other than that, I don't know of any reason why not. Uh, so. But was it not covered by the Red Hat uh, copyright assignment thingy until very I, I am not sure about that. Uh, the, I mean, this the, not the code predates Red Hat itself, actually. So I, <laughs> I wouldn't assume. Um, now, is there a chance that the FSF uh, might not require us to do a copyright assignment, just or at least not a retroactive one or, or something like that with this code? I, I don't know. Has there been any relaxation FSF policy about this kind of thing? I think that's actually realistic to expect because um, it depends, you know, I mean, if it's not uh, very strategic, I mean, I guess if we have a good reason for it, uh, we can at least discuss it with them. Yeah, isn't so for what it's worth, I'd love to see them. Sorry, go ahead, Jeremy. I was gonna say, isn't the rationale behind the FSF copyright assignment is to give the SFF FSF the power to change the licensing if someone drove a coach and horses through GPL and they could rewrite it and then apply it to the, the projects. And then you do have to have absolute ownership. You can't have ownership of 99% of it um, because you can't then, you don't own it, you can't change the license. I thought that was always the rationale. So you'd expect the FSF position to be all or nothing. 
Right. As I understand, that was one of the rationale. The other one was that that, that might give uh, the FSF uh, standing to sue someone for infringement, which is a, a separate issue than than changing the yeah. license. Agreed. Um, so I don't know if this is still a issue. Uh, I don't know if maybe Nick is in the best position to to query upstream whether <laughs> query query up uh, up the philosophy tree if that's a how much of an issue it is. If it is an issue, it might be a showstopper because I'm not sure we can get in contact with everyone um, uh, who whoever uttered a piece of code that has in the copyright on there. I will certainly do that. I will I will ask the FSF. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Anything else? Um, I have a question. Um, we have a CNULIP tree in Binutil's GDP. Actually, we used to have more than one. Uh, what is the current situation with that? Because we are about con to contribute more stuff to the Binutil's tree. Uh, and um, I mean, should we use the CNULIP at the top level? Or what should we do for portability, for new code? You said there was a second GNU lib tree. Where was that? Mm, I think there used to be one in GDB, if I'm not mistaken. Well, anyway, forget about that one. There is one at the top level. Um, okay. Should we use it for portability or not, or how? Or I always thought the GNU lib was a separate project with its own source tree somewhere else. Am I getting uh, confused? Hey, uh, Jose. Uh, so yeah, the, the GNULIB at the top level, it's, it was originally the GDB one, and we moved it out of GDB to the top level. Uh, that was part of the project to move <coughs> the GDB server oh, to the top okay. level as well. And uh, other projects are free to use it. Uh, of course, if you look into it, you'll find that it's it's, a, it's an import of GNULIV with the components that GDB needs for its own needs. So you'll likely find that you would need other pieces of GNULIV that are no, not there. So we would, we would probably have to coordinate some, somewhat. Uh, yeah, that's, but, that actually can be problematic. I have other projects where I have different components, like different libraries and, and executables, and I need different GNULIV modules in, in them, so in practice, you have to have different uh, um, uh, invocations to GNU tools, but it is doable, but uh, it's not trivial. Right, so uh, ideally, like for us, for G from GDB's perspective, we're actually running into problems because GDB uses GNU lib and BFD does not. Uh, it's actually the, the, re the remaining blocker for GDB 10 is related to this. And for us, the ideal solution would be if Unitils also used that GNULIB uh, directory for its own portability la layer. So from GDB's perspective, the ideal would be if all the components in the tree use the same GNULIB to avoid this mismatch problems. Uh, uh, so if, if some other project comes along and wants to, to work with us with, you know, working on sharing that directory, we, we were open to that, for sure. Well, Nick, what do you think? Can we just start using <laughs> the GNU-lib in Binutil's code? Yes. Let, okay. Let's do it. <laughs> there's, there's, let me just say that there's this long-standing project of even making GTC use gnu -lib and getting rid of the portability layer that's currently inside live the liberty and swap that for newly I think that's the best long term solution. Uh, so you can you can see that this is a stepping stone our moving to newly to the top level. Right. Right. Well let's wind things up there since we're almost out of time. Um, thank you everyone for joining in and voicing your opinions. Um, or, or, of course, obviously, contact me via email or anything else, or any of us on the list, if you have other concerns. Otherwise, thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of the conference. And hello, Carlos. Awesome. Thank you very much, Nick. And uh, thank you, Kaya. It's nice that Carlos is on. And thank you, for, thank you everyone for showing up. Um, thank you, Jeremy, for taking all those notes. And those will be attached to the, to the wiki at the appropriate time.
So we have a five minute uh, coffee, tea, or me break, and uh, we'll get together. Here, Carlos. <laughs> Can you hear me, Frank? Yes, you're coming in loud and clear. Perfect. I'm not too loud, not too clear. Not not very clear. No, a bit bit mumbly. No, just kidding. <laughs> Please be serious. I'm trying. I'm trying to get serious here. <laughs> I, I'm sorry. I left a serious gene somewhere up in the other house. <laughs> it's so good. Carlos, um, maybe shut the door behind your your desk. It'll just make the visual better. Shut the shut door the behind, door my, behind desk. my desk. Right in your video. There is there a is door, door is shut. shut. Oh. Okay, it looks like it's open. The door is where the windows should be, and the windows where the door. Never mind. Could you open it? I think we're feeding back through you, Ben. Yeah, thanks for meeting. Yeah, I can't get any better visual than this. I think I'd have to put up a uh, white screen behind me or something. Frank's got it good. You got a yellow screen. Uh, it's yeah. I could talk about change logs for the Julibzy buff as well. I think it's spectacular that we went with well written commit messages followed by auto generated change logs. It has made everything much easier to review people's uh, commit messages, exactly what they're going to commit, exactly what's going to go in, and then we all agree to the quality of the commit message, then it goes in as that message which has been really nice. You guys did make this change just recently, and is it just using the same code as GCC for enforcement? Uh, we did it before GCC, actually. So GCC followed after us, after okay. seeing that we were capable of doing it. So as a project, we went first. Sidesh Sadesh Poyarekar and Paul Eggert worked together on putting the scripts into GNU lib, um, VCS quarks, and then we have a front the front end that does the, the processing. So glibc has its own quarks file, and then it has the generator. And so what happens at each release, the release manager just auto-generates a change log from the commits. And likewise, on release branches, you do not have to backport change logs to release branches. When you do a release of a release branch, the release branch also runs the script and updates the, you, well, in theory, you update it. But we haven't done that in any release branch yet to date. Do you have a question, Florian? Uh, I think the GCC approach and the glibc approach are totally different in regards to change log generation. I, I think they are, yes. but. Aren't they using the same GNU lib scripts in GCC? Um, I think GCC policy is that you have, a have to have a fragment in the commit message. It, it is, yes, that is true. And glibc is, uh, just uses the auto-generated stuff that falls out of the scripts without any customization. Yes. Yeah, in, in GCC, we have a script which, which can help generating it, but it is not 100% usable. And so it can get most of the most of it, basically create a pattern and then user can fill it in and use that in the commit message. So you're not using GNU libs script plus the plus the quirks Python file to customize? No. Okay, so then you're you're not doing anything at all like what glibc is doing then. So that's interesting because I talked to the people who were going to implement this for on the GCC side, and the idea was to try to use what glibc had done. But you know, whatever works for your developers works for your developers. Well, maybe the commonality is simply that that they both got away from hand editing change log files as as classical things to escape the old uh, GNU standard and. Uh, experimenting with different methods, so that's good. We just don't write any change logs at all. We mm -hmm. spoke with Stallman, and we made sure that we were meeting the requirements for what was expected. Then we auto-generate everything. So all we have now is a commit message, which is really deep. Well, it's a detailed commit message. We work to review the commit messages so that they're at the level that the community wants them to be. Um, and then this, the change logs are auto-generated. So we don't, those are the auto generated change logs get committed every six months when the releases happen so that the outgoing tarballs have the 
generated change logs that are based on the scripts. All right. Well, let's uh, let's start the meeting formally. It's 10:30 or local time here. Uh, welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us. Let's see. Well, holy cow, we got a lot of people. Carlos, you got to make this meeting good. Holy moly, got 98 uh, people on board. So thank you for joining us, uh, Carlos. The time is yours. We have 25 minutes. Anyone wishes to talk or interrupt, uh, the normal protocol is to uh, decloak your webcam and/or microphone, and then Carlos will uh, hand you control over the sacred voice channel as soon as possible. And I'll uh, be taking as good notes as possible and shared notes. And you guys have at it. Thank you, Carlos. Go for it. Thank you very much. We don't have very much time for a boff. Those of you who have run a glibc boff before know that we can sometimes go an hour or two hours just talking about all sorts of stuff. Um, I wanted to talk just briefly about you know what we're doing in the coming year, how we can achieve that, and uh, looking back, reflecting on kind of last year's boff on some of the, the issues of patch review. So uh, we're going to release two versions of glibc in the coming year. So we've got one coming February 1st and August 1st. And the, the key thing for me as a steward is how do we achieve this? How do we come to each of these releases? And we, we do so by reviewing patches, right? Looking at stuff, what are people working on? What do they want to get in? What, what, are, what are problems people are trying to solve? And patch review has always been the sticking point. And so um, I had, was having a discussion with Florian just recently, and he reminded me about how much real good value there would be in you know, more resources put into, put into patch review. I was looking at bug review, how to triage the bugzilla, but I think Florian really reminded me that it's a much, potentially much higher value and return on those patch reviews, and I, and I, think, I think he's right. Um, now, a reminder, the patch review challenge last year was um, how could you make it so that Carlos could review 100 patches in one day, and the audience, last, audience answers last year were drugs and no sleep, um, and I think I chimed in saying those things were unsustainable, and also my family would not like to have those things uh, happen. So <laughs> we, we went on to do to do other things. Um, I was going to note that in patch review, I peaked patch review at 16 patches one day, uh, and I had some sustained patch days where I could review at 9 to 11 patches every day. That's a long way to go for the uh, for the 100 patches in one day review. Um, but as always, like in these communities and, and reflecting on some of the kernel communities and how they do patch review, I, uh, I did a few things myself locally. Uh, but first, I want to talk about uh, since last Cauldron, we have had 554 reviewed bylines. I think that's like a way to go for the community. That's a lot of reviewed bylines. That's really good. That's, that's people on the list reviewing other people's patches, um, saying they've reviewed them, uh, giving a plus one to them, you know, giving that, that this is the way, way to go. I want to thank some people. Really want to say way to go. There's a lot more people than this than this list shows. Uh, there were tons of reviewers who've been uh, providing reviewed buys. I'm calling out here six people who had more than 25 recorded reviews in the last year. Um, at Hammerval, if you're watching on on YouTube or you're here, you passed me in number of reviewed buys given. So I think that's great to see. Uh, you know. N n other people just, you know, giving reviewed buys and working really hard to do those reviews. Um, uh, was it sustainable for me for 232? Absolutely not. So I ignored all my other work, but I did manage to set up a lot of local automation. <laughs> Ed Hermel says he is in. Uh, I I ignored a lot of my other work. I, I set up some uh, local automation to be able to give tested buys as well. And uh, we were with the sourceware update. We switched to Patchwork version two, which means Patchwork could track whether things had signed off by and tested by. Which is actually nice because as a as a high level reviewer, I'm looking for things to review in the Patchwork queue, and so I can actually see if the tested by or signed off by bits are set in Patchwork, and then I can skip a patch if someone's already been reviewing it. Um, and focus on things that haven't had review and where we want to commit them. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pause here and say um, what's worked best for me um, in you know in Fedora and in RHEL has been setting up dedicated times for these kinds of activities where other people can join you and be a part of something, um, which has been to say, like, could we do weekly patch reviews split into two meetings, one for each time zone, a European time zone, a North American time zone, use patchwork, uh, keep it smooth, and involve the community. So I'm going to stop here, and I'm going to ask people's like feedback. What do they think about patch review? Uh, 
what's what's worked for you in your and other projects you've been on is maintaining a clean patchwork tree helpful um, and there is some more things we can talk about here when it comes to patchwork so I'll be quiet now for a bit Carlos, were you imagining this this kind of schedule thing being an online community sort of thing? Like, like you guys will hack on, get a bit of a Zoom channel or something, and then talk about things live? Is, is that what you had in mind for uh, timing it? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So I think the meetings that I had in mind would be something like uh, FOSS Mumble server, so people can get on and do audio, and uh, be on IRC as well, and basically uh, look at the patchwork queue, somehow get a queue order and then start walking the queue and start saying you know anybody want to look at this one or this one hmm you know we're, we're going to need assignments on this or we're going to need to review this or or maybe just basically hand out uh, what, whatever works I hadn't hadn't yet processed my feelings entirely about what we would do for these for these meetings but definitely an aspect of this meeting is walking the patch queue to see what needs review what's there um, and what the status of those things are. So I think more senior community people know what they're thinking of. Like when I walk walk the queue, it's basically refresh the queue, start from the top, and then walk that queue down and see if there's anything that I can add to my own queue to review, subsystems that I know about, um, subsystems I'm familiar with, uh, patches that I, I know are mine and I need to take, and so I can always delegate those to myself and then begin a review for those. Does that answer your question, Frank? Yeah, it's interesting. I've just never heard it done as a as a community kind of uh, project before. <laughs> so, interesting idea. Well, at the same time, some people don't know what's being reviewed or how to do reviews, and so I, honestly, like every time I come down to one of these problems where I have to ask myself, "Oh, I'm not getting X done." Getting X done generally involves for me setting aside a slot for getting X done, and then just doing that activity during that time at the very least, so that you know you've got a dedicated slot that you're doing at least once a week. So, um, let's check any questions on the public chat. DJ says, right, it's more important to remember to review the patches and to actually do the reviews together. Probably right, but, you know, what happens, and I agree with DJ to some degree, is like when I go to do the patch review, you'll find that, oh, there's a new contributor just submitted a patch for a manual. And the honest reality is that within a few minutes with Git PW and some automation, you pull the patch down, you do a build, and then you thank the thank the committer and if it's small enough you can just commit it right away um, and and push the patch so I think there were some patches by uh, Paul Zimmerman from Inria where it was a manual patch and I've just been pushing some of those qu as quickly as I can when I see them trying to give new contributors um, uh, giving giving them positive feedback loop, right? The patch review particularly in this case creates that positive feedback loop that you have with Com existing community members, community members that are kind of in between place where they're submitting patches every once in a while and if they don't get any feedback on their patches they're just going to walk away from the project and be like this is too difficult for me to contribute. Um, and then for senior people it's going to be making sure that you're making progress on your on your patches. Um, Dimitri asks what sort of automation can distros integrate? That's a really interesting question. Um, so I can maybe advance a slide and I can say um, I, I wonder if in Fedora, so we've got Rawhide in Fedora, if there wasn't some way we can do a side tag rebuild with patches. The problem is it's really expensive and it's hard to get good data out of the distro automation. Oh, here comes Florian. All right, Florian, you got a question. Go for it. Uh, I think it would already help if uh, distributions package the PW client for patchwork. Because of the mailing list status, we can't use Git AM from a from a mail client that doesn't produce a patch you can use directly because the the author is wrong due to the main main sender rewriting. Yeah, yeah. So I guess Dimitri, the question for you there is the answer for you there is integrate the Git PW client that's currently shipping in GitHub. So I think there's a PW client and a Git PW client for Patrick V2. And Git PW is really nice, integrates with the existing Git branch and helps you pull whole patch series, helps you pull um, individual patches. And if I understand correctly, based on Sidesh's implementation for Sourceware, um, Patchwork sees the emails before they receive the mail list rewriting so that the 
patchwork series apply is correct and has the right all the right info. Um, yeah, so Git PW integration. Yeah, that'd be good, Florian. That's a good point. Um, if someone's taking notes, please take notes that we would like distro Git PW integration. Uh, Mark asks, can we get the sourceware mailman issue fixed? That would help with automating some of this. Um, that's maybe Frank's here. That's a question for you, Frank. I think it's pretty hard to get it fixed because of the existing, some of the existing um, rules that might cause mail to get stuck as spam. I, I'm not sure. I'm not an expert on this, so I don't have any strong strong input here. But Frank, if you have a comment, well, it's it's the kind of the same old same old that we have to trade off. Uh, spam propagation to other sites versus uh, versus developer convenience in terms of uh, in terms of kind of faked uh, from headers and so on. So it, it, in Sourceware, we've decided to have a very clean uh, in term, very clean and prim and proper method of addressing emails and redirecting emails so that there is no way to um, to denigrate Sourceware as a spam source by means of of making sure we don't uh, we don't act like we're. Uh, let's see, we don't enable um, phishing or, or faked outgoing email addresses. So, but in exchange for that, unfortunately, it means uh, that uh, the from headers are sometimes rewritten, especially for sites that uh, that uh, whose users participate in the DMARC system. So, it is. It is a. I don't know if it's an easily solvable thing. I don't know if there's an ideal solution, um, and. I'd much rather, you know, find the sh the smallest process changes that will make developers uh, productive still than to try to fight the uh, the the internet spam fight spam war um, via us kind of being a standout lone defender. So I I know it's a it's a pain in the butt, but there are not there's some straightforward workarounds for some of these situations that that, that we've published a couple of times, and I really hope that we can give those a good hard try before we are forced to go back. <laughs> mm -hmm. No, for sure. Uh, I don't, like Frank, honestly, if we had one process that worked well for everybody, which was use patchwork and just pull the patches with PW or something, it is super straightforward. It uses a REST API, it pulls down the patches. It is so, so, it's made my life so much better. Like I got up to those 17 patches a day, that one 17 day with nine to 11 patch reviews per day a couple times, all because of GitPW. It was just GitPW series apply, GitPW uh, apply patch, et cetera, et cetera. Now, some people aren't submitting to the mailing list in a way that Patchwork can accept the mails. Uh, HJ, if you're on the call, some of your submissions to the list actually end up as blanks in Patchwork. So we can talk about that offline, but. Yes, sure. What kind of requirement I would like to follow? Any specific thing I can see the requirement? Uh, yeah, so I can send you an email probably offline about how you at how you inline the patches into your outbound emails, but that's a it's a separate issue. We can always write up a nice write up on how to get that. Um, but I want to let Tulio ans ask a question. Tulio, did you have a question to ask? Actually, I was just wanting to comment about the uh, that batch work works around the the issues we have with the mailing list. Just that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it, it was done on purpose. Um, we fed patchwork that, so this was something Sidesh and Frank worked out. Um, I think, I'm pretty sure it was Sidesh and Frank because I did nothing. I just watched both of them toil endlessly to make this stuff work. Um, in that the mail queue got fed to patchwork first. And then, so now the question is can we integrate uh, some CI into patchwork just like does the patch apply was often my first check and sometimes I think um, I'd ha you'd have stale patches in patchwork if you don't quite get to them and then they don't apply so it'd be nice if um, the the submitter could see that as well in their own queues um, I, I guess you know let me see what the yeah, I think I've got one more slide. This is just, you know, we do want bug review as well. I'm, I'm not saying that bug review is not good, but I think patch review probably yields the highest value here. Um, so we'll get to this other stuff in just a minute, maybe not. But I just want to, I want to kind of ask everybody, 
you know those those people that are here if there was any more feedback about um like any best practice with patchwork or any experience with patchwork and ci i noticed that there's some kernel people i see laura saying uh, the cki kernel testing project has done a lot of work to automatically test kernel patches and it was backed via patchwork so laura do you want to talk a, a little bit about that I'd, I'd love to hear what your experience is there because this is i think the kernel and glibc have a very similar history of patch review and that we we like to use mailing lists we like the active discussion on the mailings about the patches and so we want something that attaches to that um, i would also say we are I am okay, at least I'm going to say I'm okay with goo, patchwork goo being in our commits. That's my opinion. Anyway, I'll be quiet. Yeah, so, so um, what you're describing is, is a lot of uh, what is, especially it kind of started out as an internal project at Red Hat, but it's also gone to the community by figuring out the best way to get more automation going and uh, testing going. And especially with this, the CKI project has been a lot of uh, figuring out how to actually test patches to get some sort of uh, CI going to be able to test everything that goes. Um, it was what we had come up with was definitely backed by backed by Patchwork simply because that's what everyone everyone was using. What was using, and I can I'll see if I can try and track people down. And I would encourage people is that if you're going to be around, stop by the testing and fuzzing micro conference. Um, there should be a session there talking about the CI. I think they probably love to hear more about there. But I think specifically what um, found there is, is that they didn't have something that will eventually work. But I think also the volume that was being tested for the kernel, I think they actually began to define some of the limits of both patchwork and CI simply because, uh, and some of the problems with trying to do continuous testing, mostly because um, the big issue was trying to, is that a patch, if patches either got out of order and then trying to find a stable base to apply, mostly because for the volume of patches the kernel was testing, it was very hard to try and find if there were dependencies between um, large stacks. So that was one of the big issues that the uh, kernel tried to deal with and spent a lot of time trying to do that. But I also suspect that the volume of patches that uh, GNU C library is actually dealing with is much smaller than the kernel. So you probably would not have that. And I think that's for the smaller volume. Um, but yeah, I can try and track down some resources for what, what might be helpful for there. Our volume is smaller, but uh, we still have a lot of places where we have avoidable conflicts because we need to register files in make files and symbols in symbol lists and stuff like that. And yeah, that that is that means that uh, uh, there's a high probability that two random patches happen to collide, even though they cover different functionality, and and the implementation is independent. What's interesting to me is uh, what kind of cycle time for CI is acceptable to you in the kernel space. So we, we have the problem that we have like 70 targets we need to build for glibc. Um, and some obscure targets tend to break if you make a change. And Building those 70 targets on, um, on a decent workstation takes three hours. And that's sort of inconvenient for general developer use. Yeah, at least for the kernel in particular, um, there's the problem about trying to also, I think, test some obscure architectures. And a lot of times it ends up getting uh, farmed out to various build machines. And so I, I think as far as turnaround goes, I think part of what it is is, is that the, the flow is roughly is, is that people can do whatever testing they want on their own machines, which may or may not include cross compilation for testing, but then it gets submitted for the CI, which then gets farmed up to these other build machines and then wait for a response. And I, I think, I forget exactly what the expected turnaround time was for the build machines, but, but that, that was also a pain point there, mostly because if there were certain machines that were taking a long time, um, I'm going to pick on S390, which seemed to be one that, because it's a fairly rare, rare machine that nobody seemed to have, that one seemed to break a while. But I, I, I think to, I think most developers decided that they were willing to wait a few hours for results, which, which seemed to be um, mostly okay for them. But I think part of the point is with the CI is that the testing is happening on other machines, so it's not like their machine is entirely sitting around. Um, uh, burning up cycles for three hours at the point is that they submit it and then they get response, response back later. 
Sorry, and when you mentioned uh, make files and symbolist collisions between various patches, is that something you guys could just change your tooling a little bit so that the instead of having all those things in single files, you kind of can attach them together from like a directory full of separate files, the same sort of trick that we do in RPM with the .d directories, something along those lines? Yeah, or a markup in the source files themselves so that you have everything in one place and it gets auto-generated from there. I mean, it's not really something that's inherently difficult to solve, like uh, uh, cementing conflicts or something. It's just a matter of changing the build system. And that's an area that's not really fun to work on, <laughs> unfortunately. Uh, it, that's true. But what I like is that everyone has inherently gone to the next step, which is how do we make the CI work? So there's been nobody who's been really disappointed with maybe taking a direction in which we m integrate patchwork a little more, given that patchwork is integrated well with the ma email workflow, has command line clients that allow you to work in your in a Git tree or multiple Git trees, because Git PW can use a local Git config per tree. So you can actually have Git PW do different things depending on what tree you're in. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is interesting. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Frank, do you want to say something? Yeah, <laughs> five minute warning. Yeah. I think we're at the four minute warning now, but, uh, uh, yeah, so uh, we can spend maybe a few minutes talking about, um, any other stuff. Are there, I want to give people a chance to, to ask questions. So we, we've talked about, you know, this, this patch patch review, patchwork kind of integration process. I would really like to start uh, doing some kind of weekly meetings where we do some patch review. So I'm going to follow up with the community on that. Um, and it sounds like there's some, some interesting places where we can borrow from other communities for this. Now, there's a bunch of other stuff we could talk about. And I've listed a couple of things here. Uh, restartable sequences, the DSO work for Mentor, uh, HJ's uh, CPU features, which needs another review. RB32, 64-bit time T, and malloc hook deprecation mtrace. Does anyone want to speak to any of these or ask any questions? I would like to add a warning that uh, there's going to be a bunch of more, uh, additional loader changes from me coming down the pipe. I hope to get the glibc HW caps work finished this cycle. And that's going to be like 30, 40 patches to review, depending on how I'm going to split that up. And then there's the lipid removal. Um, I would like to take a step on uh, on that during this cycle as well. And that I don't know how many patches that's going to be. It's going to be fairly substantial, but we can do that incrementally like we did before. And the third thing that's going to be tough is the um, startup code changes. We have a long-term security bug, security hardening issue where the statically linked startup code has a very general um, ROP gadget in it. And that requires changing all architectures basically to switch to a different startup sequence sorry no i'm raising my hand because um so hj's tunables capability for listing tunables with the uh ld dash dash tunable list actually involved startup code changes and we knacked it for 233 because it would require general changes across all the architectures so if you're already thinking about touching all the startup code it may be a potential for us to both do the uh, having the dynamic loader list the tunables it knows about and integrate those things along with the static startup changes and if we do both those things at the same time we may be able to get all the machine maintainers to do just one review of both of these changes so i'm just calling that out because it would be good to do both things at the same time possibly um we've got we got one minute remaining um uh, anybody else have any other questions uh yes so, Florian updated the uh, x86 PS API to including the uh, ISA levels. Uh, I'm, I have proposed the API chain to mark those libraries. 
uh, indicating which ISA library it requires. So that uh, because we're going to have a bunch of shared library with the same name, and uh, we can not, we may not know if we get a shared library, we may not know what kind of ISA level it requires. So my I have a proposal to mark those libraries with required ISA levels. Any thought on that? My initial reaction is that um, it only works with LDSO cache. For if you locate the libraries uh, through the LD, through LD library search path, then you have the issue that you can't really find the appropriate library um, because you only have the so name and the so name won't match the file name in general. So that's probably something for the main list. I'm not sure if we can hash it out at this point. OK, let's talk about it on a minute. Um, thanks for everybody for coming. Our time is up. Thanks for listening in and giving input on uh, patchwork discussions and uh, some of these final final items. Thanks, Florian. Uh, thanks, everyone who asked questions in the, in the public chat. Uh, thanks, Frank, for taking any notes. If you managed to take a couple of notes, I, I really appreciate it. I'm going to go dump those into the glibc wiki. Thanks, everybody. See you around today. Perfect. Uh, good job, Carlos. Yeah, in the shared notes section, I, I tried to take as many as I could. Uh, feel free to review them. I think you guys might have editing access to that just to, to fix anything that's not quite right. But good. So thank you very much. Another session all done. All right, next up in no fewer than 165 seconds, we'll have this wonderful talk with Florian and Nathan. So another chance to go get up, stretch your legs, and uh, we'll get started in about two minutes. Okay. Stretching your neck is really good too, Nathan, very good. <laughs> I seem to have control of the slide, so that's good. Nathan, I like the t-shirt. Drink gin. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Yes. Yes. Um, I've been promised a martini later today. Oh, that sounds like it. You wonderful. <laughs> but it seemed to be a little bit early for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah.
All right, all right, all right. By my appropriate GPS synchronized uh, internet clocks, I think it is time to uh, hear the next talk. So thank you everyone for coming. Thanks Plumbers Conference 2020. This is a talk by uh, Nathan and Florian about C++. Awesome stuff. So general protocol is if you need to interrupt or say anything, uh, you can decloak, unmute your microphone and uh, camera and the They'll get the view an opportunity to ask questions. Otherwise, I hand the floor over to Nathan and Florian, whom I'm sure most of you know very, very well. Thank you all, guys, and good luck. OK, thanks, Frank. Um, so this is scheduled as a boff, but then I wrote some slides. because Florian suggested it, and I wrote some slides. So well done, Florian, on offloading that work. <laughs> um, and I'm just going to talk a little bit about what these header unit things are because I think you need to understand that to understand what the implications are for the uh, glibc and kernel header interaction stuff that uh, Florian was interested in. Um, so, and things moved forward since my talk last year. Um, and, and so header units are this thing like, that are similar to pre-compiled headers, but they're not pre-compiled headers. Uh, they're more plugged into the language than head of the, the PCH, and they're not intended to um, support all the function uh, functionality of a header file. Um, and in C++20, you can import them directly like this, which gets a bit weird writing import without a hash, but then putting angle brackets on std IO and then a semicolon. But you get used to that. Um, and uh, the other bit is that the compiler can treat a hash include of studio as if it was written like this under user control um, uh, to actually do that as an import. Um, they're not infected by macros from the importer. So this studio.h, you've built this in some mode and you get an artifact that's then pulled in in that import. And the hash defines that are visible at the point of the import don't go into the studio, so they're, they're isolated in that way. Um, and the thing is, not all header files can be header units. Obviously, header files that are meant to stamp out code like .def files can't be header units. Um, but there are other restrictions as well, as we'll get into. There are some excitingly, exciting bits. Oh, OK, yeah. Here we go. How you build one in the current implementation of GCC on the modules branch. Uh, this is how you can build them. In particular, this is how you build stud.io, for instance. You say it's a system header, uh, and uh, it goes away and searches on the system include path for stud.io.h, and goes away and builds it as a header unit, and then you can say import. And this building builds this thing called a, compil a compiled module interface, which is the artifact that's read in via when you import this thing. I stick them in a per build, GCM cache directory by default. And at the moment, these things, their serialization format is locked to the compiler build. But I'd be hopeful that we can actually just lock it to the uh, major and minor, maybe minor version on releases. Um, and the important thing to realize about these things, they're not really distributable because they depend on the options that you compile this with, like maybe, you know, uh, particular CPUs where you turn the optimization on because that defines the optimized macro and stuff like that, or MD bug or things like that. Um, so you should think about this thing as a, as, as a cached art, a caching artifact for your particular build and not like a redistributable object file or library because they don't have the ABI stability of object files. Oh, and you don't get an object file when you're building a header unit. That's specifically one of the design decisions that was taken, um, uh, which has pros and cons, but there we are. Uh, OK. Right, so with header inclusion, you use guard macros to stop yourself defining the same thing in, one, in a single compilation. But guard macros don't work with this module import, the header unit importing stuff. We now get multiple definitions in a single program. Uh, and the compiler has to reconcile these multiple definitions, or in fact, different de declarations of different header units. 
uh, and say, oh, this is actually the same thing. And this is all happening at the namespace scope level, the global scope. Inside a class, not a problem. Um, and this thing called the one definition rule means you can have multiple definitions of classes in a single linked program. And we use traditionally duck typing to make these, to say these things look the same so they are the same. Uh, but we had to tighten up these rules somewhat for modules. Um, and generally, if the thing has got a name, well, that's the thing. It, class Bob has to be Class Bob everywhere, and it better be the same definition everywhere. Otherwise, you've got an ODR violation. Okay. First problem is that header files are full of unnamed enumerations, and you try and make them the same. For instance, enum falls true in one header, enum falls true in another header. Then I come along another header that says enum falls true file not found, and you've got an ODR violation there. Uh, and I've been informed by the Clang people that glibc suffers from this problem, but unfortunately they couldn't remember where, which is a bit of a downer. Um, up until it, in C, these things, this is not actually a problem because the false and true have the type of the underlying type of the enumeration, generally an unsigned or signed integer. Um, and they're essentially like, they are integral constants without any storage. But in C++, these constants have the type of their enumeration. So you can actually overload on them, but you can't overload on these because they have no name. And actually we discovered that prior to C, C++ 20, these were ODR violations in the first place because these things were different in the formal specification of the language. We fixed that. Um, so these things work, but it's better if you give them a natural name and then make it clear what you're trying to do. Uh, what happens here is that these things don't work because it says they all they all begin with false, so they're supposed to be the same, but some but they're different. So you may or may not get an error because it's an ODR violation, and you don't actually need to give an error in these cases. Uh, okay, right. Yes. So the other confusing thing about header units is that the contents of different header units can be known transitively. Um, and you may have named modules, which is the other bit of the modules, import different header units, but not re-export them. Uh, but then if you re-import, if you import those two modules into some particular compilation, compilation um, the contents of these two conflicting definitions becomes known to the compiler, and it will bath at that point if you're lucky. Otherwise, it'll just randomly pick one and assume you know what you're doing, and sadness will result. And I think this is the point that uh, Florian wants to get on to, because this is what we know exists. Yeah. And here's an example. This is uh, basically what you see on the left side is the underscore underscore u64 definition from the kernel headers. And in the glibc headers, uh, for the same type, we usually use un64 underscore t. Sometimes the difference is mandated by POSIX, so we don't feel like we have a choice there. Sometimes, sometimes it's the result of a deliberate policy on the glibc side. And these, we try to make these things benign today by including the kernel headers if available. But that means that the types are unstable from a programmer perspective and cause problems with printf format specifiers, even today, even in non-modular world. And with C++ modules and the transitive leakage, I'm not sure what, what to do there. Right, and yeah. This talk. Hmm. And for, formally, this thing is an ODR violation at this point. Whether your implementation detects that depends on the implementation. So whatever, uh, and it sounds brittle to me, whatever, if we manage, if this happens to work, it might explode tomorrow when something else happens or something else pulls in something from the kernel or GDBC or looks at these things and it goes it goes boom. 
Um, what did we have? Oh, right. Now, another a, a common thing that's in header files, C header files, is called static in, because inline has different semantics in C and C++. You use static inline for C header files, and that has the same meaning in C++, except it's an ODR violation when you then include that header, that, try and reference that header, that, that static inline function from an inline function in a header file because this breaks the ODR rules that this thing points to the same definition in every translation unit because it can't because this thing here, clever, is in fact static and internal linkage. So it clearly only appears in, each instance of it only appears in exactly in, in one translation unit. Um, and this is undefined, this is an ODR violation. Uh, however, we've finessed this in header files. So this is no more broken than it already is, we hope, in header, for, header units. Um, and this was a fairly recent change. Uh, so I haven't entirely got my head around it. Um, and my implementation has hacks to make things work because an instance of this is the gthread.h header file that we have for um, POSIX or other threading wrapper stuff. Uh, so I've got some hacks that come from the early days of this before we figured out how to deal with this. So that's good. Uh, right, yeah. Uh, oop. Yeah, so hang on, why is it not moving on? There we go. Uh, oh, it skipped a slide. Yeah. Header units ex preserve the existing brokenness of that. Um, and you either see different static in lines or you all see the same static in line. Uh, but the meaningful programs, not either solution should not make a difference. Uh, where I've got new implementation for unnamed enums, we now, that example that I said will now give an error when you try and import all those three definitions of the, of the unnamed enumeration. And I said static inline, there are some hacks there, but it's not complete. Uh, there we go, oh right. And I thought about building. You have to build these things before you can import them. Um, and then you can only find the header units by compiling their importers because that's where you see the import statements. Um, and this is an unanswered question about what the best solution for this is. Right, so that's the quick tour of header units. Florian, did you want to talk about what you would desire this gave you? So the, the obvious uh, hope is that eventually this will allow us to solve the uh, user space uh, glibc header versus kernel headers conflict we have, at least for C++ programmers. So uh, like uh, we, 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 it, it has proven to be close to impossible to make sure that you can include both kernel headers and related or semi-related glibc headers in the same translation unit in arbitrary order and uh, get no conflicts regarding um, definitions of the same structure, enum or whatever. And what's particularly annoying is that you get conflicts in bits of the header you don't even care about for writing your own code. So the hope I have in this context is that with the uh, preprocessor isolation we get for real modules, we might be able to either hack something that works in pretty much all the cases, even though it might not be probably defined <laughs> by the language standard, or if that is proves to be too brittle, um, start writing C++ modules for the glibc, uh, the, the external glibc interface, so that you may have to use a glibc, a glibc specific namespace to get the glibc definitions, but then you can be assured that due to the preprocessor isolation and the namespace isolation, you will be able to always use 
um, kernel headers with glibc headers in the same translation unit. Yeah, as um, long as there's no macro conflict for stuff you actually use. Yeah, the the um, C plus plus committee is thinking about how to turn the C plus plus standard library into a named module, but that's very early at the moment and uh, uh, will be a few years away if that uh, produces something. Um, I think I've forgotten my other point. Oh, right, yes. So. Uh, LTO already hits this problem, these kind of problems, but at LTO level, it's dealing with the underlying representation of these two members, and they're the same. They're both 64-bit ints, and it doesn't care at that point. But it, too, has got heuristics to tell whether this, this kind of mismatch is benign or not. Unfortunately, we can't do that at the language level because you can inspect what the type of M is, and as Florian mentioned about printf specifiers and whatnot. And uh, uh, overloading and template meta programming in C++, yeah. which means that the, the types really have to be distinct. Yeah, yeah. In, in the middle end, we consider those types to be compatible in for the for the middle end, and that's that's why we don't care that much. Yeah, that's awesome. the the. Um, uh, clearly, the symbol names of, of things emitted from header units is unchanged from what it was as, a, as they were as a header file, and uh, I guess most, most all of glibc is extern c anyway, so it's the plain unmangled name. Uh, that's true across imports from, mo uh, from named modules, but you probably don't care about that. Um, yeah. Uh, Florian, when you said by, uh, you know, uh, a GDPC specific namespace. Uh, will that how will that work with the user code that wants to say you know um, call open? If that's in a GDPC specific namespace. Or... Uh, I mean it's it's very early. I don't. It's just an idea. But you would you would have to do the same thing you had to do for C plus plus when C plus plus transitioned to namespaces. So you would either use the prefix or using namespace glibc. Like you, uh, some okay. some programmers use using namespace standard today and live with the breakage they get occasionally as the, as the result. I wonder if it's possible to build header units with specific flags, actually um, revise those definitions because once you've built a heading unit it's an opaque entity and, and you can't change its meaning when you re-import it. I'm not, not a very clear expression of what I mean. But uh, um, supposing you decided that you were going to change struct X in the kernel case to agree with the glib C case and you made that a conditional compilation and basis of it internal headers. You now build a header, a header unit with that flag set at build time. The flag will not be exported for the first time. But you will now have an exported kernel header which has a variation of struct X which will agree with glibc. Right. I think the, the difficulty there is that the, the, the kernel wants to write it like this because it's the same type on all architectures, whether they're an LP64 or an LP32. Uh, Unsigned long, long will be the same type. Is that right, Florian? And, and they don't want, you don't want that kind of conditional code in the kernel headers themselves, because it's just a maintenance burden. Is that? Yeah, is that they, they want to use uh, percent %LLD or whatever that the format specifier is for 64-bit integers on all architectures instead of Putting in a macro to dispatch to the, the pre-IX thing. Yeah, yeah that, macro, nobody yeah. wants to use that. Yeah. And <laughs> and uh, I think that is that that's totally fine. But the the objection to that or the counter argument is that what do you do if you get a, a, a an architecture where unsend long long is 128 bits? Agreed. But and, I mean, okay. You 
that's my argument to make the conditional compilation part of the LIBC. So to make that be really better with the kernel. Right, but I think, you know, Florian mentioned uh, that sometimes GLibc is constrained by POSIX or something, some other standard that specifies the type. Is that? For the C headers, that's definitely true. I mean, our practice uh, is not entirely uniform because in some cases, historic type differences are very hard to address, like it doesn't make sense to rewrite a uh, struct message buff, which is used in the networking code, to insert padding that is required by POSIX or remove padding that is required to, uh, by POSIX. And it, it, that there's just too much breakage if you try to do that. And yeah, um, we, we have made adjustments but uh, like that in the past to fix POSIX conformance issues, but my personal feeling is it's always a little bit weird because the kernel interface is probably what we should stick to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, um, I see D sorry, go ahead. Sorry, I see DJ's got a question. Why aren't we consistently using the int NN under bar T types? Um, and I think we are, it's just that they have different definitions in the two libraries. Is that what you were saying, Florian? Because I've, I've written these with the underlying type, the, the type def that the two systems use resolves to. But are they still yeah. essentially the same in the source? Um, no, the kernel, uh, the kernel uses underscore underscore U64, but uh, then the, the, the actual name doesn't matter. They, they want to use a different type mm -hmm. than what we want to use. And we, yeah, can't like really, yeah. we can't really, for historic reasons, uh, we can't, uh, I mean, we used to have 64-bit compilers before we could assume uh, long, long support in the compiler. So we had to use long as a type in the header back then because yeah. long, long wasn't a standard type. Yeah, so I think the the answer is well. Unfortunately, they have they have different definitions or the naming of these things. Um, okay. Are there any other comments? Other than we need to think hard on this. I don't get the don't get the, Florian doesn't get to realise his dream. Uh, Nathan, Florian, I, this is a, just a dumbbell question because I, I'm not familiar with this area very well, but could you just remind us uh, what is the overall benefit of this whole module system? That is it just, oh. a, just is a major performance benefit for compilation or, or what? Just Again, I'm just a newbie with this part. Sure, sure. Um, so uh, it, there are three aims, and I can remember some of them. One is build performance. Um, uh, and that's particularly the aim with these header units, is that uh, for modern C++ code, you end up swallowing like several hundred thousand lines of header file and then f 50 lines of code. And your compilation spends all its time tokenizing that and validating all the header file stuff. Whereas the idea with the header unit is that it's done that once and, and when it's actually loading up the header unit as an import, it never actually does much because all the implementations have taken the same approach of doing that lazily. They populate the byte, the symbol table and then go, yeah, I'll go and load these things up when you go name them. Um, so the cost of doing an import is very low uh, until you start using it all, uh, when it's then proportional to how much you use. Um, the other thing is, is that um, it, uh, it, it protects things from macros. Um, so you don't have this header file cross pollution of your header file, seeing things from header files that you already included, uh, or pollute exporting stuff that it didn't intend to, and then users relying on this feature. Um, is that Hiram's rule that uh, people will start depending on this accidental ex visibility of something? Um, and the third case is um, that it actually makes it harder to have ODR violations. But the corollary of that is it therefore detects the ODR violations in your existing code. 
and that's the, kind of the problem that's going on here uh, and how to solve that. Um, Right, Ben is saying that, yeah, it's link time. Um, yeah, compilation time is also a problem uh, in large code bases. Um, but yeah, link time is too. Um, yeah. All right, thank you very much for humoring that question. Uh, if there's nothing else, uh, time is more or less up. Any parting words, guys, or from anyone else? Uh, if not, in that case, oh. <laughs> Thanks, guys. In that case, thank you very much. And uh, I'll hand you guys over to the next uh, moderator and we have a next uh, five minute gap between uh, now and then. Have a great time, guys. Thank you very much. Yes, bye. Okay, so we have like three minutes before the next session, which is uh, a couple of uh, lightning talks. Hi, Arjun. Hi, Jose. Am I uh, too loud or too too quiet? Or I think you are perfect. All right, great. Yeah. <laughs> Frank, I think that you are perfect too. Now I'm getting, now I'm blushing. It's a good <laughs> thing I have the camera off. I'm all just red all over. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't think I'm perfect. I was just looking at Bugzilla and it seems like I created my first regression <clears throat> from the very past that I'm going to talk about now. But I guess that's life. So I don't know so much about it, uh, but Carlos has asked which bug. Um, it seems that uh, the relatively big, well, relatively for me, big patch that I submitted has caused a regression in bind text domain code set. I don't exactly know what the function does, but it seems like it's part of the internationalization li library. So <clears throat> I'll have to look at it. But we can discuss that during the talk officially, maybe. I don't know, is it very urgent? Did you break the build or something? No, no, don't no, don't no. talk about it. Focus on your uh, on your lightning talk, but I'll have a look at the PR. I'm sure they're doing something wrong. I mean, yeah. It was it was funny that we found out that these double slashes actually everybody thinks that they're the end specifier, but they're not. Glibc had this notion of triple definition. It was a, a thing, a thing, and a thing except that everybody always admitted the first two things and that, and it had been so many years since people admitted the first two things that everyone thought the syntax was slash slash but it's not <laughs> it's it's thing slash thing slash thing yeah so, give your talk forget about the problem so shall i start already yes now it is 30 in my in my watch so Awesome. Please.
Uh, hi everyone. Um, I'm Arjun. I work on the Red Hat Platform Tools team, uh, mostly doing some stuff with glibc. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, my attempt uh, at fuzzing uh, glibc's icon program and also the function. And it uh, led me to, I think, my so far biggest patch in glibc. Um, so I'm trying the slide thing for the first time. Great. So it works. Um, what is icon? It's it's basically uh, a program uh, as well as a function by the same name. Uh, both of them uh, do the same thing. Uh, they convert uh, text from one encoding to another, and um, you can see the invocations there. Pretty simple: minus f minus t. And with the function, uh, you actually have to call icon open with the conversion you want to perform, and then uh, follow up with uh, multiple calls to icon, and you pass buffers to keep uh, converting uh, the input to, a, to an output. And um, the function actually returns uh, the number of irreversible conversions performed. That's, that's a sort of strange thing. Uh, I'll come to it in the next slide. I'm going to keep this kind of fast, and then hopefully we'll, we'll end early enough to be able to answer questions or talk a about, bit about this. Um, so the next slide, it's about uh, transliteration and invalid input. So the glibc icon uh, implementation tries to follow POSIX, of course, but it has a couple of extensions. I mean, the, the main ones are these. It's basically about, uh, so transliteration is basically about trying to convert uh, something that cannot be represented in uh, the target character set to something that looks similar to it, basically. So here's an accented A. In Czech, they say A, ah, and it looks like an A. So if you see A, ah, you might want to print A if you can't represent it any other way. So here's an example where I tried to print um, AA or A, A in ASCII uh, using icon, and it just basically converts and transliterates the accented A to a regular one. So that's transliteration. And the way you enable it is that in the two um, character set, you, you pass a kind of suffix saying uh, translate. So that's how glibc enables that. Uh, similarly, there's, there's another option called ignore. And it's also interestingly passed in the two character set. And the thing is, uh, if there are any errors, because either the input doesn't actually match the character set that it claims to be, uh -huh, I see a question. Uh -huh. All right, so we'll come to that. Uh, so you can ignore uh, errors, basically, when the input is not matching the character set it claims to be, or when you cannot represent the input and you don't want to trans transliterate to the output. So you can also do that. So here, for example, I'm trying the same thing, but instead of transliteration, I'm saying ignore uh, in inputs that you cannot uh, actually represent in the in the output, and uh, icon will actually do the conversion uh, only for characters that it can convert, and then for the rest it will just give a kind of error message uh, to std error. So these are the two like extensions that the the glibc implementation provides, and uh, the whole fuzzing thing came up when when I was looking at this bug, which is a very old bug from 2016. And it was a report for uh, a hang in icon. When you pass, um, so hex 80 is actually an invalid ASCII character. So it's trying to convert hex 80, which is invalid, from ASCII to ans ASCII and passing translate and ignore. Uh, minus C is actually just to suppress uh, error messages. So if you look at the previous slide, it's to suppress something like this, right? Um, and that led to a hang. The, this just doesn't return. I didn't know much about icon code. Um, I still don't know much about the converters, for example. The, there's, a there's a file called loop.c, which I just don't know what's going on there. Uh, but I wanted to investigate this, and I started looking at like trying to change, uh, swap around these options, and see what happens. And uh, eventually, I realized that, for example, if you pass ignore first and translate later, uh, it doesn't hang. And uh, 
so that started to look strange and I went into that code and, and I noticed that actually internally iConv is doing string manipulations on uh, on this which which seems like a very bad idea uh, because you're constantly looking for uh, slash slash translate in the code and uh, so I want to kind of make sure that this is actually the problem the problem is that we're, we're doing string manipulations and Working with limited knowledge of icon, uh, noticing that I that AT is not a valid ASCII character, and uh, also seeing that the code doesn't handle suffix cleanly, it it does all kinds of like string manipulations to pass them around, copy them, stuff like that, uh, and also not knowing what other character set, character sets might be affected because if you look at this, this is just an ASCII to ASCII conversion, right? So I decided. Uh, why do I look at this so so much? Let me let a program figure it out. So that led to basically a bash script. Let's call it a fuzzer. It's, I think it qualifies for a fuzzer, um, where I pass every possible two byte uh, input. So that's about sixty five thousand inputs to every possible character set, uh, converting to UTF eight with every reasonable combination of suffixes that I can pass. And that leads to about half a million uh, calls to icon per character set. And it takes a lot of time. So it's actually not 10 cups of coffee. It took like five days maybe for the whole thing to run through. And um, by now, it was already 2019. Not that that matters, but yeah, it took a while for me to get to this. Um, so when the results came in, there were actually 167 different character sets that had hangs in them. Uh, most of them were were when you pass translate and, and ignore together. Uh, five were converter bugs. Actually, there's a separate report, I think, that was filed uh, in the Red Hat Bugzilla about that. And Florian kind of noticed that and pointed it out in this bug as well. Uh, but that's a separate thing. Uh, 167 uh, hangs seemed like a, like a juicy, low-hanging fruit. Uh, and I decided to kind of try to uh, target that. And eventually, uh, I ended up rewriting uh, the part of the icon front end, which uh, does string manipulations, and kind of got rid of that. And instead of uh, using strings to store whether we're doing transliteration or ignoring uh, invalid input output, uh, we started using a conversion specification structure that's used throughout the program. And uh, yeah, basically, that was it. Uh, that fixed most things. Uh, if you were there just before the talk started, maybe you noticed that someone recently filed a bug uh, about something that might have regressed. I'm not sure. I have to look at it. Um, but this is basically the story that I want to talk about. Um, so what next? Uh, there are five converter hangs in um, IBM um, character sets. There's also... Uh, something about ignore. So I mentioned earlier that ignore can ignore uh, invalid input that doesn't match the input car set. Uh, but it can also mean uh, input that cannot be trans cannot be represented in the in the output character set when you're not transliterating. So input ignore can mean different things. And one of the things I wanted to maybe discuss is, or if, if possible, is whether we should have two ignores, uh, whether we can have an ignore on the input side and an output side. Um, is that useful? Is that meaningful? Um, also, you know, um, another thing to think about is like, could we have a new interface? Because passing strings, uh, you know, added on to a function, uh, it's just not clean when we can actually pass a structure instead. Um, yeah, that's the bug I just noticed. Uh, I think another thing I need to do is to improve test coverage. All right, so I took too long, uh, but at this point, questions or suggestions or anything? Uh, Carlos, I think maybe you wanted to ask a question.
Carlos is muted. Is there something no. I need to do to? Okay. No, apparently it was a blitz. Okay. Okay. Well, if no one else has any other question, thank you very much. Thanks. And Have a great uh, day, everyone. So the next lighting talk is uh, linking LTO and Make. Uh, John Ravi, John. Ah, there you are. Hello. I can see your video, but I can't hear you. Can you please say something? Now can you hear me? Now, now I can hear you. I guess awesome. other people can hear you too. Okay, so let's go ahead. Thanks. Are we starting early then? Do we start now? Or, yeah, I think there's a five minute break, right? <clears throat> Yes, that's what I thought, but then, as I yeah, said, start, so I'm confused. Yeah. If, um, if you just wait till quarter past, that'll be great. I'll show quarter two. Quarter two. Um, it just gives our people on streams and other things a chance to join in. Perfect. Okay, so we wait.
Okay, I think <clears throat> it's like right. 45 or Yes. Okay, cool. Um, all right, so my name is John Ravi, and uh, I'm giving a brief uh, update of my Google Summer of Code project. Um, and for those of you who are unaware, um, Google Summer of Code is a three-month summer program to bring uh, student developers into open source software development. And um, I am currently a PhD student at NC State. So, um, and, and my mentors were uh, Martin, Lexa, and uh, Nathan Sidwell. And this project basically is um, aims to like solve a problem with the with linking uh, LTO um, parallelism with uh, the build system, spawning multiple jobs. So um, I'll go briefly go over like the motivation of this project and the stuff I've done uh, so far, and the final steps I'll do to finish the project. So um, briefly, the idea is that um, with LTO, um, you compile you can compile a lot of uh, the the source code in parallel into object files. And with link time optimization, you do um, it's a serializing step uh, at the beginning. Uh, basically, it will do it'll look at the entire program and do optimizations at the um, object sort object level. And to um, and, and since this is a serializing step, it, you lose a lot of performance um, in the compilation. So there's this other technique called a whole program analysis, which aims to solve that issue. Um, basically, when you compile these object files, you, GCC includes um, intermediate language representations um, in the object file itself, so that when you do the linking, um, it spawns another GCC command, which will do optimizations in parallel, and then finally creates a binary at the end. So. Um, with this, there's a problem with um, how, not a problem, but like inefficiency, I guess, with uh, how GNU make uh, job server works. So there's different modes that um, make can do. So you can either spawn make uh, jobs without any parallelism of just calling make, or you can spawn it with infinite number of jobs uh, slots by doing make dash j. But if you want to limit the number of um, concurrent jobs possible, you supply it with the argument, uh, make dash j with the number after it. And this um, limits the number of concurrent jobs that are executing at once. And uh, make does this by using uh, tokens, one byte tokens. And this allows, um, this allows like limiting the number of concurrent jobs to occur at once. Now, um, you can see that like, this is um, inefficient because uh, it'll limit the number of jobs spawned when GC when it calls GCC commands. But GCC itself, you know, the linker is uh, spawning jobs um, inside of it too. So, in theory, you can like there's cases where you can spawn more jobs than um, there are slots available. Um, so it kind of breaks down the use of um, the build system's job server. So that's basically the, uh, the, the issue that I'm so trying to solve with this project. And to combat that, like, this project basically uh, aims to provide more tight um, communication between the compiler and the build system. And to do that, um, I modified GCC's uh, LTO wrapper to um, act as a uh, client to the job server. Um, and this is possible through um, using Nathan Sidwell's uh, libcody. So libcody is a, a library. Uh, it stands for compiler dy dynamism. And basically, it's an implementation of um, a communication protocol between compilers and build systems. And it was created mainly to service the uh, C++ modules, um, modules uh, use case to create a more tight integration between the compiler and uh, build system. But we realized that like it can also be used for this problem too with LTO. Um, so I modified GCC, GCC's LTO wrapper to be to act as a client to, um, to the job server when you set an environment variable. And basically, the LTO compilation requests are sent to the job server. And I also modified GNU makes um, to act as a server. And this was a it was a little tricky because the library itself was written in C++ and uh, GNU make was written in, uh, is written in 
C89. So I had to port some of uh, the internals of make to support C++. I know it's frowned upon, but um, just to get this like uh, proof of concept working. Um, so basically now um, make uh, acts as a server and it it gets the uh, it gets the commands from GCC and then spawns the LTO compilations based on um, by taking a token essentially. So um, now that I've proved that works, um, I need to basically enable and verify the performance with this parallelism and also backport the uh, libcode library to support C so that the, it can actually get patched in, into uh, good new make. So um, yeah, that's, that's basically it. And I included links here um, to the uh, branches of what, where I'm developing this stuff. And this week is the last week of the Google Summer of Code program. So I'm finalizing some of the uh, implementation details and writing summary for, the, for my approach. Any questions? Uh, John, this is Jeff Law. Um, have yeah. you looked at all at the work from the SUSE guys where they wire job server directly into uh, the LTO system? So when they, they, you can say, you know, GCC dash F LTO equal job server, and it will run out and, and communicate with the job server. Right, yeah. So it does have a, uh, a job server built into uh, LTO wrapper, but um, I guess the idea of this is to like, uh, allow make because you know, like recursive make is a thing. Um, so like allow it to have like a global um, knowledge of like all the jobs that are being spawned. Uh, yeah, Je uh, Jeff. So uh, Martin was of course aware of of, of the, that, uh, but he suggested this project because um, I think you know they found that having a job server client inside GTC is a little brittle. In make files, because make files then have to have to tell it. Have, you have to put a little plus sign in front of the command, the LTO compile, to so that make knows to the, to pay attention to its job serveriness. Um, whereas this was a kind of a more general mechanism to try and avoid that. Well, I think what's nice about what you've done is you're exposing the jobs that the LTO kicks off, and that's kind of. That's what's nice is, is you want make to have that kind of visibility. Um, so I was just I, again just curious how the two projects are related to each other. Thank right. You. Yeah. Yes, you're exactly right. So in, in the job server case of the job server being in GCC, GCC gets the tokens and does the spawning itself. Whereas the goal here is to actually send the command back to make and say run this when you're ready, and then just give me the answer when when they're all ready. Um, and, and, and put the put the put yeah and put the control of spawning jobs back in the make that originally spawned the LTO compile. Yep, perfect. Thank you. And this is something that can be used also with with Juliano's uh, break on on the single TU. Uh, compilation where where we also need to communicate with make and yeah and you know what, what this reminds me a lot of is kind of the oversubscription problems we had but it's kind of in reverse here and that we're we're not exposing we don't have visibility but the the, the class of problems we we're seeing here is very very similar to what you see with OpenMP when you combine it with uh, other uh, parallel things that might be happening under the hood. Um, you, and, and so the general question is, how do we, and at what level do we expose parallelism for, for each one of these projects? And I, and I, I really like what you've done here, John. Um, and it's just a question, how do we make, how do we, how do we get it in and make it, everybody use it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think the, would probably end up having to have this as some kind of plugin to make because I, I don't think rewriting libcode in C is an attractive um, uh, mechanism for that. Uh, I think it would be more, and, and and as I discovered because I originally had a hack to make to for modules and um, to as a proof of concept. Uh, Make's internal architecture needs a little bit of rearranging to make this easier to do. Uh, and I think that's the issue that John has run into now. Um, 
as well. Uh, so uh, it would be nice to have it as as make, but probably as maybe as as, as, a, as a shared object that plugin or something. Uh, an augment makes plugin architecture to deal with that. Yeah, thanks, thanks, John. I think you've done a done a done a really good job on on proving this this thing can can go end to end. So, thanks, John. Okay, I think my time is up, so I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, so now we have five minutes break before next session. Okay, Ben, he just ran away. I hope he will be back. Okay, how does my audio sound? Was it's okay, it's good. Good, good, okay. Just want to make sure that I don't have feedback or echo or whatever. Was well. So three minutes. Quick question, what is the plus button down in the bottom um, left? Left. Well, as the presenter, you can basically upload your presentation, things like that, but every, everything should be ready for you at the moment. Okay, great. Yeah, I so think so. You have to use it. Well, I got you here and I got a minute, um, Jose. Is there any way to edit program text with your GNU poke? The, like, say I want to, like, like basically disassemble and then replace it with a, a particular piece of, a couple bytes of code with different opcodes without, does it do that? I was kind of watching for it in your talk and I didn't see it. Well, you mean like inserting new new data of a different size? No, I was thinking like, oh, okay, I want to see how much, if I just change this load to a NOP, for example, yeah. to, see how, um, to see how much that impacts performance with that, mm -hmm. you know, but I don't want to have to like go and look up the opcodes. I would love to do it in assembly. Yeah, well, for that, you will need a pickle basically describing the instructions for the architecture you are interested in. And then, yeah, sure. I'm doing that okay. already for BPS. Okay, cool. I just hadn't had a chance to look at it. 
Okay, so now it's six. Okay. So please go ahead, thanks. So um, anyway, this is, um, um, there it goes. Okay, um, so for those of you who don't know me, um, I've been at Red Hat 19 years, and my main job is to work with um, the DOE and the uh, national labs. Um, and the reason they do that is because they break everything all the time. And so I tend to be more of a jack of all trades than anything. Um, but you know what they say about jack of all trades, they're really the master of none of them. So, um, so anyway, like we all know this. Um, the thing is, it was like 1987 when Unixus 5 came out. Um, and one of the big things about um, um that happened during the unix wars is they were all fighting for market share and so that the, there was a good solid customer feedback loop running in parallel over those years and then over the 2000s as linux um was um taking over we um, we basically faithfully implemented the last version of the standards now now we are here in 2020 and Linux runs the world, you know, that's great. Yay, 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 we've done it. Um, the thing is, uh, the world's changed a lot since then, you know, um, and I, I summarized many of the differences that I've seen over those, those um, three decades. And, and some of the things that I think are really, really important is the difference between like the centrally managed system um, um, built um, by professional system administrators versus DevOps, you know, the, the slow release cycle versus the high release cycle, um, and just the amount of software that's out there. So, um, you know, because they break everything, um, I tend to get a big overview. And one of the things that I've kind of come to believe is one of the sources of our problems is really um, our dynamic runtime linker. You know, I think that it was designed in the 80s and it needs to be rethought um, at a level. So, um, so anyway, we're looking at, let's take a look at like, LD.SO to cache, you know, this is one of the things. It was a great piece of engineering um, for the 1990s, you know. Um, does anybody really use the cache anymore? Um, well, you know, the thing is, yes, people use it, but it's not really being used effectively. Um, you know, people don't install things in opt. They're, um, we don't have big directory hierarchies. And the thing is, a lot of times the code um, that we're actually running is off on enterprise project volumes or is in a container that's running in its own namespace. You know, it, it really it really feels like the design of it was to treat uh, non-root installed software as second class to kind of push people over towards um, <laughs> using being a more centrally um, managed um, system. Now, if you look at it, um, um, there's uh, like, why don't we have something like LD, um, LD config and have it, um, um, have it create a local user cache? Um, you know, um, um, why doesn't it automatically learn where the um, the binaries end up being? So um, another example of what what I um, what tends to come up is run path. You know, it kind of really seems like it, um, it's from a different time when software is centrally managed by a sysadmin. The um, you know, there's kind of implicit assumptions in it that the app and library developers um, know what they're doing, but really many times they don't. And, you know, after, um, after that, the system 
um, assistant admin and distro maintainers carefully updates and curates the things, you know, but really we're kind of living in the DevOps world where our path is the big hammer, you know, and it defeats a lot of the advantages of dynamic linking because they're saying, no, go right there and uh, do it. But the reality is uh, our, the big software is uh, really fragile. And so everything ends up in a container. I'm going to pause here and look at some of the questions uh, because I see um, a bunch of things coming over here. Yeah, it's like, um, I, and I, I would agree, um, Nick, you know, you do need a cache, it's, um, but it doesn't need to be a system wide. Um, and like, is it a per user? Is it a per directory? Um, you know, and so anyway, yeah, that, uh, that was the thing. Now, um, why are, why are, why do we have containers and our and why is our path overused? You know, um, and I think, um, uh, one of my coworkers pointed me at this uh, this tweet, and I thought it was really um, very fitting. You know, when containers arrived, good software version management stopped. You know, and I think that's really uh, the case. But I think that part of the problem really comes to limitations of our our tooling and its. Um, and what we provided. For example, let's talk library versioning for a second. You know, this would be like part of the solution. You know, unfortunately, it really doesn't work in um, uh, practice. You know, developers um, forget to update things or they don't care. And, you know, then there's this big question like, what exactly is a release? You know, whenever you're updating the version number, you know, how many times have we come across the case where they decide to stick the um, name of the uh, the package version number in the library version, um, or um, and then then especially with C plus plus, developers have a huge amount of trouble um, implementing um, knowing exactly what imp uh, impacts the ABI, and you know the way that. Um, we've built things is there's actually um, multiple versions of libraries don't really get installed in the same directory. So you don't get that searching and, you know, the tooling, it could be better understanding lib tool or how to do version numbers for libraries and CMake, you know, it's, it's not the most obvious thing. I'm going to make an assertion here. A library's version is, is, it's ABI, which really isn't in, captured in a number. You know, um, you, whenever you look at it, if you uh, compile some things with different compilers, you end up with slightly different um, um, versions, um, depending on the tool that you're using to build it. Um, sometimes this is important, hopefully many times it isn't or there's compilation options that can affect ABI. And so a version isn't, um, isn't the thing that completely defines a library version. So, uh, you know, here's, here's just an example of one of the library versioning problems um, that I've run into over the years. Um, and, <clears throat> It, it, I mean, I've simplified it down to the very basics, but an app requires B and C. Um, B requires um, version two, C requires version three, but in the library search path, it comes across the version of the library number two rather than the version three, and so things blow up. Um, another really common challenge um, for us is whenever we have first party, basically performance tools, um, that um, they have to be compiled against exactly the same library version as 
the um, the version of uh, the the program that they're using because if they access data inside that program, they have to have um, they have to know the exact layouts, and that um, that has been con um, um, has been particularly difficult. And and so anyway, that's. Um, those are some of the library versioning things. You know, one of the, the things that, because I work in the HPC sector, um, MPI is, is like one of our banes, but it's also our, our main workhorse. It's a standard API, but uh, unfortunately on the ABI level, it's all over the place. So like, there's no standard Fortran ABI, and so um, sometimes the compilers um, generate things that are different. Um, you know, um, the MPI maintainers are famous for regressions, so you run into like, well, to work with version one, two, three, but not four, and then they fix it again in five, six, and seven, um, and um, and then we've got many different implementations. You've got OpenMPI versus MBAPH. Some of them, uh, you've got them compiled to work with um, OPA or have one compiled for Mellanox. Gets to be a real big problem. Some of the workarounds that we run into, uh, have, uh, we use is like LMOD, but that only gets you so far. Um, and so in reality, what we end up doing is we end up doing parallel builds of every piece of software with each compiler, with each version of, of the compiler, um, and with each MPI. And so we have this massive um, tree of, artif of compiled artifacts that are built with vertical, um, vertical tool chains. So now another big problem is the C++ uh, fragility. Um, I think all of us remember the the dual ABI for libstandard C++ back in GCC5, and then we're coming up on it again, you know, um, the ABI now or never. Well, how are we going to um, deal with that? I think, you know, that's, uh, it really comes down to defining um, the ABI and having the loader um, look at ABI whenever they're um, whenever it's loading artifacts to make sure that they actually match up. Um, another big problem that we run into is library search orders. Oh my God, this is this is an entirely different class of problem than we've run into in the '90s. We have big apps you know, literally hundreds of libraries. And the thing is, all of the infrastructure for the caching is not useful because it's maintained on a system-wide level. It's all out on NFS. And so between the LD library path, the R path, the run path, um, we end up with um, search paths that are literally hundreds of elements long. And this just beats the crap out of our servers, <laughs> um, you know. Um, because we don't use um, read or have um, or cache the directory contents, that ends up with like literally millions of enoents and very slow short, um, uh, job startup times. Um, one of the solutions that we worked on is this project called Spindle, which is a really freaking advanced um, LD audit library and. Um, it, it was very difficult to get it working properly because um, because of the way that audit libraries run in the um, in the uh, private namespace and accessing symbols from the 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 namespace is, is still broken. Um, also, we have limits on using it because whenever spin loads libraries, they end up in their own namespace, uh, in the private namespace, and so you can really debug applications that are running under Spindle. So, 
Another one, and Florian is working on this, um, is ISA subversions. Uh, you know, we know about uh, iFunks, but you know what? They only work at the level of a function. Uh, they can't handle inline functions. And whenever you have I ISA subversions, where you're taking the same source code and compiling it with different optimization uh, uh, targets, um, it's hard to get those into a uh, thing. You can probably, you can do it, it's just difficult. Um, HW caps, um, you know, I hope Florian makes it go away, um, but um, this again exacerbates the problems of of um, uh, directory searches and it just kills our file servers. Um, so, you know, so uh, I provided feedback to Florian about um, uh, what we think about his kind of levels idea for the uh, doing HW caps. I think uh, hopefully uh, the big thing that we've discovered is it's not really levels, it's uh, ISA subversions uh, tend to be more uh, representable as like a DAG as opposed to a series of levels. And um, so, um, but it could be implemented in such a way that it'll flatten out HW caps, which will solve the, um, some of the search um, problems on our file servers. Another thing is it's been 30 years. You know, we, we really haven't been focusing on uh, tools interfaces. You know, we've got, um, and I'm gonna admit that this is a grab bag of miscellaneous items that um, are, have been outstanding issues, um, but that we aren't, haven't been looking at for a while, you know, DLM open and private namespaces really are not debuggable. Um, whenever you have a tool running inside of a, um, the address space of another library, of an, an application, um, has the, the way that it has to access um, um, features of the dynamic linker, it's a big problem, you know, being able to um, have a library go and modify its own um, um, uh, got so that it can do, um, so that it can um, um, wrap functions when needed. You know, this is a particularly important for um, performance tools, um, you know, or another one is to how to embed LD audit libraries so that some professional can attach the, the performance tool to a, a particular application. You know, um, and this is right now we've got, uh, you know, and these are some of the examples of problems we've run into, like um, basically providing a tool interface to other libraries, you know, one really common example that we're looking at, right, uh, that we're running into right now, is let through on um, thread DB. You know, how do you find the right one to associate with um, a particular um, program running in a container? You know, um, why isn't it part of the same ELF file so that it's right there and you provide an interface um, to the um, um, from the uh, the loader, so that what you actually do from the debugger is enumerate the interfaces. You know, some a similar sort of problem is OpenMP's runtime um, also needs to provide an, uh, a tooling interface and a debugging interface. And whenever we get full C++ parallelization, they're going to need the same things as OpenMP and OpenMP uh, uh, um, D, like debugging and tooling interfaces, um, but they haven't realized it yet. You know, um, what other libraries could really use um, real debugging interfaces, you know? So, so um, 
one of the biggest things that I think um, is illustrative of some of the problems that we have that we need to rethink is honestly distro building. You know, making a, a particular distribution is fundamentally about AVI. You know, you've got a um, a collection of software with an inter internally coherent ABI that stays coherent through the le release. Now, I can't tell you how many hours um, Red Hat and other distro maintainers spend maintaining and up uh, updating software while maintaining the API. It's a uh, it's a big part of what Red Hat and any distribution uh, uh, does. Um, now we're living in a more de um, DevOps world, and you know what? Because it's uh, been such a challenge with our tools, we're finding that people are um, sidestepping the problems, you know. And so uh, they're by by wrapping everything into their own consistent thing. Going back to that slide I had earlier about how software management has. Um, um, has just gone to pot, you know, and so we're missing a lot of the advantages of dynamic linking uh, because of it. So, um, you know, so this is my main point, you know, it's like more than 30 years after Sys5. The Unix wars are over and yes, standards are like really important, but you know what, we're the standard now. Uh, the computing world is changing, it's time to get back to engineering solutions to me um, customer needs, you know, and that, that's the big thing, I, you know, um, I would argue that the rise of DevOps and containerization is probably at least due in part to the weaknesses of the loader, you know, and I really want to ask, are we meeting the needs of software developers now? Robust linking, faster linking, performance uh, performance tools and debugging tools and um, so so I, I thought I'd open it up for discussion I have some crazy ideas put them on this slide and people go ahead ask questions I haven't been able to keep up with the chat I'm sorry Anybody got any questions over here? Um, if not, I will put, I, I will talk about one of my crazy, uh, Carlos, go ahead. Can you hear me, Ben? Yes, I can hear you. So a um, lot of good crazy ideas. And in fact, I sit through your talk mostly as penance because I'm a C library steward and a self-flagellation is required to remind me of all the places we need to fix stuff. Um, if you had one thing that you wanted to see fixed, like if you prioritize this list, I'm because I'm a big fan of all the all the things that we could do, but if there's one thing that we should be doing, what would it be based on your experience? Um, an ABI aware um, loader um, with um, that gets over the performance problems of it um, for by using except, uh, intense caching. And the good news is um, somebody just got given $5 million to work on it over the next three million uh, years. How do you see that money being spent? And are they going to work directly with the upstream community? Or what's the, is there an idea there? I um, yes, there's an idea there, and um, I've got. I mean, I'm very happy to share it with you. I can share it with you directly, and then over the next little bit, we're going to figure out how do we interact um, with the audience. That's like work later this week or next week, I guess. Awesome. Thank you. I'll let other people ask a question if they have any. Yeah, you know, Dimitri, you said one of the things like I want to be able to build a cache for a given LD library cache. What I believe is 
Yeah, I mean, we've been doing initial evaluation of this and what it's going to be is probably you have a hash of LD library cache, um, then build I, uh, ideas and it goes through, I mean, uh, um, LD library path. And then, um, then it uses build IDs to verify and then it just loads them rather than searching. So that's my idea on how to do it. And my time is up. Thank you all. Thanks, Ben, for the talk. Okay, so now we have five minutes break until the next session. Am I audible? Oops. Hi, Nick. Am I audible? I hope so. Not there very well. Not very no, well. There is, a, there is a wind apocalypse going on outside. There's nothing I can really do about that. Um, I think it's sort of related to that. I think it's, I don't know, you are like breaking, like the sound is breaking from Yeah, power. yeah, it's, I, don't, I, I think it's. I know, I, I don't think it's, it's something about the atmosphere at the moment. It suddenly started happening in the last hour as the wind built up. I don't think I can change that. Um, there's, there's a, there are 80 mile an hour winds outside. It might be related in some way. Okay, and maybe might, maybe you could try to reduce the gain of the microphone a little bit. Maybe it will help to make the sound more clear. Uh, any better? Probably worse. Even worse. Uh -uh. Ah, any better? No. No change at all? Uh, oh, oh, no, it's better. Yeah. Oh, no, now you are breaking very badly. Well, I can't, I can't really can't do anything about it. It's, 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 it's my only headset, it's my only Bluetooth receiver, and it doesn't do non-Bluetooth. Okay, maybe we could try the, you know, the classic solution, like no, no keep your Chromium or your web browser and pair it up I, again. I think it's having trouble coping with the enormous wind noise. Eighty mile an hour winds right outside. Okay, now it's better. So don't move. I don't know what I'm you did. Don't move. What, yeah. what, what happened was that the wind. What happened was that the wind died away. And as soon as it dusts again, I'll break up. I can't do anything about it. Ah, uh, okay. I think. My apologies. Oh, maybe. So two minutes. Uh, my ba my bandwidth is crazy. I, do, I, do, I very much doubt that's a problem. Wait, so I'll try turning turning my useless webcam off. Um, but I suspect this is a Bluetooth problem, an environmental problem. Uh, any better? Probably yes. Not. Well, the wind, the wind yes. just died down again. It, 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 I think it's literally wind and echo cancellation. There is no laptop mic, so I can't use the laptop mic. But yeah, it's the wind, and the laptop mic would be even worse if it, if it existed. I'll I'll leave the um, webcam webcam off. It doesn't not bring buying us anything. <laughs> Yes. Uh, my apologies if this seems totally disjointed. I wrote it while I, I, I wrote the slides while I had COVID-19. There will be a lot of coughing, I fear. <laughs> okay. So now it's 30, so you can start when you want. Okay. Um, this, is all, uh, this, uh, this is all about um, a... Um, a debugging format inherited from Sun and modified extensively and further modifications are planned. Um, the idea, excuse me, of course, like it will let me go to the next slide. 
The idea is that it's modeling a, sing a single scope of the C-type system, um, a basically a gl global scope of a, uh, of a single translation unit. Um, and, it, uh, and that you, um, this is generally used for debuggers, but it could also be used to represent the ABI of, the ABI of shared libraries and queries at runtime or something like that. I gave a talk at last year's LPC about it, in which I foolishly said that the problem of deduplicating the huge numbers of types, which duplicated types which come in from individual translation units, would be easy and done by December. I finished it in May. Um, given the, uh, it, this turned out to be because there were, there were quite a lot of problems I didn't, I, I didn't think would happen. I, I, I didn't think would happen. Um, but if you, if you don't take care, because graphs are involved, it, 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 you could have horrible time complexities. You can have horrible space uh, space complexities. I have avoided all of these without without dropping into too many traps. I thought I, I thought it might be nice to nice to say how um, C is coming. That's at the end. It's right. It might come. It is a nightmare. I haven't even begun to think about it. But the algorithm I described here should work for C as well with minimal changes. Um, because the things that cause cycles in C++ are more or less the same things that cause potential cycles in the type graph for C. Um, the algorithm is fairly efficient. I've got some sizes there. The input size in here is the sum of all the, C all the CTF sections and all the inputs. Uh, the CTF is generated directly by the compiler. Um, that, that isn't that stream yet. Um, and the, the, the shrinkage is fairly substantial. I mean, from from five me, from five meg to fifty k is not bad. From seventeen meg to two hundred k is not bad. It's going to get better because this is, um, because there is a file format revision coming up, um, which will shrink things significantly. Um, thanks in large part to ideas from um, the time the time it takes is fairly is not bad. There are significant improvements I could make, and it's not multi-threaded, so there's a lot of, of low-hanging fruit still on the tree. Um, and uh, it's notably, it's significantly faster than Dwarves, probably because it's got much less data to chew over. Um, it, it almost always quite, has massive reductions in sizes. I mean, look at that, 16 meg to 80 to um, 200k is not bad. So, um, a brief introduction to the absolute minimum about the type section because I don't want to spend spend any time on this and it doesn't really matter to the algorithm. Um, CTF has lots of sections in it. We only care about one section, the type section, um, because that's the section we're duplicating here. It's a variable, an array of variable of variable length entries. Each C type gets a single entry. Um, the Type the kind of type is, for example, int is a kind, const is a kind, a point is, all, all pointers are a kind, volatile is a kind, structures are a kind. I couldn't think of a word for it, so kind is as good a name as any. Um, the length of these arrays varies. Um, they, it is literally uh, array entries vary. It is literally a, um, and the index is, constru is constructed. At, at the mapping from index to offset is constructed at load time. Um, there is a parent-child relation. Uh, there, there is a parent-child relationship involved here. You can have child dictionaries, uh, which can which can connect to a parent dictionary and refer to types in that dictionary. Um, so you can have a parent with lots of common types and lots of children hanging hanging off that parent and referring to types in the parent. Parents can't refer to types in the children because a parent can have lots of lots of different children. The deduplicated uses this. Um, this is something that BTF in particular does not have. Uh, but CTF has always had e even in the first days. Uh, there's re uh, um, the boring non-deduplication basics of CTF um, is that it, it, it's almost all reusable code. So things that aren't the linker can that aren't the can do what GLD does and li and uh, deduplicate and CTF sections against each other. Uh, the API is stable. I don't plan to break it. If need be, I'll use simple versioning to avoid breaking it. Um, if you have a look in Binutils, it includes CTF API H. You will see, uh, you will see the API. It's quite it function starting CTF link. It's quite simple. Um, inside, um, libc, in, inside libctf itself, CTF link C 
um, does the how it implements this API and calls down to the deduplicator in CTF C to, uh, to do all the actual work of deduplication. Um, it's, it's nicely decoupled. It doesn't have to do much other than provide mapping. Um, it's also worth looking at the CTF, CTF impl H, which has all the data structures that deduplicator uses. I hope I'm still comprehensible. Um, there are several problems I had to deal with to avoid absolute nightmares inside the, inside the deduplicator's code. One I haven't mentioned here is there's an awful lot of iteration over things going on. Um, and you, the normal way one, uh, 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 one iterates over abstract data types in, um, in, in C is to have functions that take, a, uh, take callback and, and, uh, and avoid pointer and repeatedly call them. If you're doing lots and lots of this, this soon takes your code into your code into spaghetti. So I've got so I've got functions with with next in the name, um, which which act kind of like Python generators or an ordinary for loop and return uh, and return entities you're iterating over one at a time. This is ever so much easier to use. I, could, I think everyone should write their iterators like this. Uh, it might be worth looking at. Other things we do, uh, we have to do over and over again. Uh, we have a lot of references to two types in the inputs. Um, to, uh, to types in the inputs are um, are saying we have a type here. It is in this tra it is in one this particular translation unit. We might um, every, we, we want to be able to refer to every type in every translation unit we're, uh, we're fed, and we don't want to have to allocate memory every time we do it. Um, so we cheat. We uh, we number all the input translation units starting from the start of the link line. It doesn't matter how you number them as long as all the numbers are distinct. Um, Inside each translation unit, the types have their array index, and we jam them together. And the, each, of, each of these is 32 bits long, the result is 64 bits, and we can store it in a pointer. Um, and then we can shove the pointer into a, into a hash tab without doing any memory allocation. This is gross, but it, uh, but it works, and it's fast, and, uh, and it makes the code simpler. And the other thing we need to manipulate a lot is hash, table, is, is hash values, because once you've deduplicated the types, um, it, 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 is, it is represented via an SHA1 hash value. We don't want to have to allocate memory for these over and over again, so we intern them in a hash table um, and, and, and use a pointer to that instead. Uh, that's nice and simple, and it's what everybody does. Um, the, um, the, uh, the, uh, the input type identifier is the, un is the unusual part, and also the only part where we have special code for 32-bit platforms with, with shorter pointers. It's kind of gross, but it does work. Very brief overview of the algorithm. It's three-stage. Uh, I know that BTF has a seven-stage algorithm. Um, we don't actually avoid those stages. Things like deduplicating strings don't come into this algorithm because we do, we do it elsewhere. Um, First, we work over every single input translation unit and hash every type in all of them. Um, we recurse to, sub to, to types that are referred to by each type, so pointer to something will hash the something first and, the, uh, and then mix that hash into the hash of the pointer. Um, once we've got these hashes, uh, we, we, consi we, we, consi we consider these hashes to be deduplicated type values that we will have to omit. Um, this is time critical because there are, could be a huge number of input types. Everything else is much less time critical because we're dealing in deduplicated types from once we've done this and it's much, uh, and the time can uh, uh, greatly lift it. Once we've done, d done all of that, we have a bunch of hash values which correspond to deduplicated type values, but we still have the problem that because CTF is a model of a single translation unit, there's actually nothing stopping you having two struct foos in different translation units which have different definitions. This is not C++, there is no one definition rule. So we hunt across the set of, uh, all, all, all the set of name, to, uh, name types to find um, uh, with, with one name and many hashes. Uh, we, we, we call those ambiguous types. And we, and we know that we have, to st we have to store them separately. In fact, we store them in child translation units corresponding to the, to, to the, um, to, to the input key used. And yes, this is, uh, this is exactly, I stole, or how shall I put it, I, I talked to Doji before I started working on this and took some ideas from Lib Abigail. Thank you very much. Um, in, uh, and in, in, emission is a matter of working across all these types and emitting them only, uh, only once. That's the easy part. The hard part is cycles. C, uh, and the C type system is acyclic. CTF is not acyclic because if you look at if you look at the um, 
uh, 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 these structures here, the classic C cycle problem, CCS has only, uh, only one slot for struct foo in its main lookups. So if you exert a forward to struct foo, and then exert struct foo, it replaces stru uh, struct foo with, uh, uh, with, uh, with uh, uh, the, the forward with the structure. And all of a sudden, you now have a cycle. So the inputs will, ha will have cycles in them whenever you've got something like this. But even if they didn't, we want the outputs to have cycles because whenever you see a structure like, a, a structure like this with, foo and, with, with things with cycles in them, you want the user to be able to get from struct foo, from the struct foo star to struct foo, and from struct bar star to struct bar. So you want to create cycles even if they weren't there. Um, so the C-type system suddenly, suddenly becomes cyclic. So we have to deal with cycles in all three of these situations. The first approach I, I tried to use was to preserve all the cycles. This is what the BTFD duplicator does. Um, to pre preserve the cycles, detect them uh, in, li in as close to linear time as possible, stabilize them so that no matter how you enter a cycle, you still get the same hash for, the, for every item in the everything in the cycle if, the, if it's the same cycle, and then you duplicate them. This doesn't work. It took months. Um, it took months and it doesn't work. It doesn't work, but this is the problem on the left here. Um, if you, uh, uh, both of these should be struct cyclic in both of these cases should be duplicated together because, it, uh, because it's identical. On the right, the, the right hand side it is a forward, on the left hand side it isn't. Struct cyclic star is certain, but if you hash things in cycles by, de by stabilizing the cycle, the things on the left are going to have a big different hash values from the things on the right because they don't appear to be in a cycle when you hash them. So stabilizing cycles doesn't work, we have to break them. So how do we break them? The limit case would be to break every si every single uh, to, to break every single thing. Never mix subtypes into types. This fails. You, you can't say that const const void star are the same thing, or all pointers are the same thing. You'd have a disaster as soon as you hit, hit emission time. So you uh, so you have to you have you have to break consistently, and, and you uh, and you have to break you have to break in without knowing whether the thing you're breaking is in a cycle or not. Um, we, so you break up the one thing every cycle in C needs, tag structs, tag unions. Um, it, it, it is impossible to have a cycle without a, without a tag struct in it, uh, because, you, because there are no other forward references, there's, uh, because a forward must be involved. Um, so, uh, so, uh, but but we, we do not want to, to, uh, to even, if we break cycles at tag structs, we do not want to, uh, but by, by stopping hashing as soon as you hit a tag structure, that doesn't mean you don't want to hash the tag structure when, it's, uh, uh, when, when we encounter it at the top level. Two structures are different, even if, uh, the different members are different, even if they have the same name. So we hash things differently if we are hashing them in just to mix them in the terms versus if we have, uh, versus if we're hashing them in at the top level to get a, um, uh, um, as, we, as we work across every cycle, sorry, every type in, in the translation unit. We hash in what we could, if we encounter a tag structure when we're doing channel recursion, we hash, in a, we hash in a stub, basically the name of the struct. They, are, they, they hash uniquely, all stubs, all, all stubs with the same name hash the same value, and forwards are hashed with, with a given name hash the same value as the structure with that name. So all, of a, so, so all of a sudden, if you look on the left-hand side, struct cyclic, now, uh, um, if, when you're hashing struct cyclic star, and you mix in the, value, the hash value of struct cyclic, it's got the same hash value in both cases, because it's a stub in both cases. Struct cyclic star now has the same hash value in both cases, and it's deduplicated cor uh, 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 correctly. This, this, works in, this works in all cases. In particular, it works for my, for my monster test case, which is struct BFD, which has something like 1,500 types underneath it, some of which are different in different translation units, just to make it even more horrible. Um, this, was, this was an absolute nightmare to make, to, to make work. Here's a horrible example of something with two interconnected cyclic structures. Uh, this, dedu this deduplicates correctly, even if, even if some of these are, are, are opaque in one translation unit and not opaque in, an, um, in another one. But um, hashing is only the first stage, though. Once, it, once, you, once you've hashed, 
What happens if you've got two two, two types with the same, uh, with the same name but different uh, yeah. uh, but different but different representations? Say one is an integer in one translation, a type guess of an integer in one translation unit, and a type guess to a longer another, or structures with different names in different translation units. You can't represent this um, in one CTS dictionary um, because of, because the types are the types are inconsistent. We don't even know which ones they are yet, but we uh, but now we have uh, um, um, hash hash values which correspond to structural equivalents. You can hunt, you can find them by looking for for hashes with the same name, but different for so places places where where one name has has multiple hash values. Um, if, as soon as soon as we find one of those. Um, we know that uh, uh, we, we know that, it, that if you have to, that if we have such ambiguous types, they cannot go into a single shared shared CTS dictionary. They have to go. They, they, they have to go into dictionaries which are children of that shared dictionary and which refer and which refer to them. Um, but worse than that, if you if you have a share a, 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 if you have a, 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 an ambiguous type. Um, with say a type in two translation units with different definitions in each. If a type refers to that type, it, which does it refer to? It depends which translation unit it came out of, because it, one of them could be referring to the long, and one of them could be referring to the to the, to the int. So anything anything refers to an ambiguous type uh, is also in effect ambiguous. To avoid a horrible collision of terminology, we call these things conflicting. They're not ambiguous, but they refer to things that are ambiguous. Um, and, things that, and things that refer to conflicting types are also conflicting. It's recursive. This means we can get stuck in cycles again, because except that now we're walking up the type graph to things that cite other types rather than going the other way. Um, we don't want to emit whole cycle. If a conflicting type is, is in a cycle, we don't want to emit the whole, um, um, consider the whole cycle conflicting. In any case, it could be huge. We actually did this with BFD at one point, and we ended up with, I think, 18 megabytes of CTS data for LD. This is not good. Um, as was noted earlier, we end up, we've got more like 80K in there in the end. So we break the cycle. Um, we break it in exactly the same way. As soon as you run into it, uh, uh, when you're w w walking upwards, saying everything that cites a, a conflicting type is conflicting, as soon as you hit a tag strike, you stop. Tag uh, things that refer to tags, conflicted tag structures are not marked conflicting as a result. Um, it, 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 it is literally a Merkle tree. I still, I, I, I still the idea this mix-in thing. It's, it's straight out. It's straight out of the, it's, it's the same technique. I still can get. It can get. It should work everywhere. Um, uh, the, the, the rule I've got, the, the rule we use, is that as soon as you hit a a, um, a, 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 a structure. Uh, uh, if you're marking things as conflicting uh, uh, because they refer to ambiguous types, as soon as you hit a structure that refers to ambigu uh, ambiguous type, you mark it, you mark it as, con as, as, as conflicting. But, th but, but if you run into a structure while an, a, a, a conflicting structure while you're um, while you're emitting a, 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 a emitting the types, you emit a forward to that structure into, into the shared dictionary, and then cite that uh, cite the forward. For, um, instead of, of, of citing any of the ambiguous types, um, this, wor this works because if you, if you think about it from the, perspective, from the perspective of the user for a moment, if you have a struct T, um, and there are several different struct Ts in a um, in in a um, in different translation units, if you're using it from some other translation unit, you don't know which struct T you're referring to. It could be either of them. This does actually happen in, in weird object-oriented C and that sort of thing. Um, in that situation, the right thing to do is simply say, we don't know which it is. We'll punt it to the user. The user sees a forward when they try to look at this struct T. They'll have to tell the debugger or whatever, you know, I mean the struct T from, the, from this translation unit rather than another one. We don't, we don't try to resolve it for them. We just send it to forward. Um, uh, we, uh, we, we also buy a bit more space. Um, if for, for, for non for, for, uh, for non structures at least, if you've got one type that is very high, one type foo that is very highly cited by lots of other sub, by lots of other subtypes, and one type that's only used by one or two, the type that's only only used by one or two ends up in a, ends up in a sub dictionary and is not conflicting. The other one it's shared, uh, and we don't waste space. 
um, it saves a bit more space. It doesn't actually save any time, and it doesn't resolve any cycle problems. What resolves cycles is de is dealing is dealing with this structure. Uh, it, so is 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 breaking things at structures yet again. Sorry, this is going so fast. There's a lot to cover. The uh, the the easy part of all, of all of this, once you've got a, a, um, a pile of, of individual hash values, each of which is a deduplicated type, and, a conf and an is this conflicted marker for every, every one of them, is emitting everything. Honestly, I've, honestly, I've covered most of this already. Emitting, um, the only hard part is emitting, is emitting a forward if we run into a conflicting structure. The, um, the, only, other, um, the, only, hard, the only tricky bit is we have to remember to actually link types together. We, uh, oops. We have to, um, you, uh, we, 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 whenever we emit a type, we remember what output, what output ID it has, um, what output ID we got when we, when we, when we, when we emitted that type. Um, and when we emit another type that refers to it, we emit from leaf to root. So we must always have emitted all the types that, that are referred to by a type before we emit that, that parent type. As soon as, we, uh, whenever, whenever we emit the parent, uh, we can look up the, 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 the um, Output type IDs for all the children and link them and, and link things all together. This is more complicated to describe than it is to implement. It, the implementation is quite simple uh, if you have a look in CDFD uh, um, this, this actually works with no, with no further changes, but you end up with terribly deep recursion because whenever you run into a structure, uh, you find you have to emit all the structure numbers, and some of those will have other structures in them, and so on. You can end up being sort of 90 or 100 deep to avoid. Pointless extra recursion. We simply don't emit any struct members. We emit we emit struct members later in a separate in a separate pass. And by that point, all the types are emitted, so we um, so we know we can emit them safely um, with with no dangers of cycles. No, it's just a straight linear emit from beginning to end. It's it's nice and simple. But this isn't needed for correctness. It just means you can run with a bit less stack space. Um, there is still more to do. Uh, um, <laughs> There are a lot of places in here where, uh, where, where we have to deal with, with tiny little sets to make sure that we're not uh, 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 that, we, that we can only have one of something, generally one of a hash value or one of a, of a, um, of, a, of, a of an input type or something like that. We implement a set using a Liberty hash tag. We have at least one of these per type. In fact, we have at least two of these per input type. So we have tens of thousands of Liberty hash tags. Liberty hash tag is a rather large data structure. It's several hundred bytes. This is not efficient. Um, oh, good. I, I am planning as well. This is not efficient. Um, I, 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 am, I, I am planning to fix this with a patch that lets you share so, most of these copy constructors and so on between types. Um, this isn't implemented yet, so I, I want to do it without changing the API for our hashtag users. Um, but it should, it should let us save about 40% of our memory usage, which can reach four or 500 meg in the case of, la in the case of large translation units. Um, you could multi-thread. Um, I have seen things that take up to half a minute to deduplicate, but those are monsters like Nuvokeo, which has 100,000 types in it. it uh, um, C++ is going to introduce many more types, and probably, probably that's the right time to, deduplicate, to add multi-threading. That's where GNU-lib comes in handy, um, I, I suspect, because LD and multi-threading isn't really something that's been done yet. I haven't really thought about other languages much, uh, mostly because they, they've got quite different type systems, and I don't even know how much of a C++ type system we want to encode. Um, C++ has the saving grace that it's got exactly the same things that a cyclic that C has, i.e. structures, to class, classes, and unions. So I think the same algorithm will work. I think it will hardly really be changes. Things other than C++, I haven't even thought about yet. Their type systems are too different. It's quite possible that CTF would be the wrong um, would be the wrong system for us. But yes, I think this deduplicator would work for C++. But that is a, a, a very much a future problem. Um, there's a few references here: the algorithm, a bit more linking machinery, um, the API. It's also worth looking at CTF impl h in the libctf directory, which is all the data structures, where all the data structures come from. There is a giant comment at the top of CTF DWC, uh, which describes the algorithm in hopefully a more comprehensible fashion. And I have a lot of, uh, a, a lot of uh, speaker's notes, which are also hopefully harder to understand, are easier to understand than this very quick run through. Um, was this even
but comprehensible. I hope so. Was it interesting? I hope so. Um, any questions in the no time at all? I've got left. <laughs> Oh, well, I should say thank you to Liz Abigail for something very helpful, very, very helpful indeed, and a very nice talk with Doji last year at LPC. Uh, have you considered um, support for type annotations in the code to help disamb um, disambiguate the ambiguous types? I think if you need annotations, you're probably doing something wrong. Um, I don't think we've got my, my only worry with ambiguous types is hash collisions, but the situation in that situation, the situation in that case is to move to a better hash. Uh, that ambiguous types are always always disambiguated reliably. If they were, the emitter would actually crash. <laughs> um, oh, time is up. Um, so the, 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 I, there are changes to add things like um, like GCC GCC type attributes um, in, uh, in the pipeline for the next file format. There may well be uh, uh, the ability to add some extra kind of attributes at the same time, but it shouldn't change this algorithm. I hope. Okay, thank you. This is all upstream now, by the way. The um, it's as you see from the links. No one has said it. The city doesn't work. <laughs> okay. No questions. Any other question? We still have some time for questions. There is some. I have to say that I have seen this being developed from very close, and I can tell that this type of duplication is being a pain in the ass. That oh it God, works. the intermediate version is so ugly. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thanks, Nick. All right, so we have like four minutes three, four minutes until the next session. Hi, David. Uh, testing, testing, one, two. Perfect. Ah, okay, that's good. Very good. You can hear me? Mm -hmm. And it looks like my camera is working, so. Yes, it is. Cool. Uh, hopefully the volume is, uh, microphone level is okay. I think it's, it's perfectly fine. Great, thanks. Okay, so we have three more minutes before starting. Yes, I should just do I, yeah, that makes sense. Oh, excuse me. Okay, I think we can start now. OK, uh, I'll go for it. Uh, and you can still hear me, OK? Uh, yes, perfectly. OK, okay. great. I'll, I'll go ahead then. Um, OK, um, thanks very much for attending, everybody. Um, I'm David Malcolm. I work at Red Hat on GCC. And in this session, I'm going to be talking about the Dash F analyzer option that I added to GCC in GCC 10. I'm going to talk about uh, the option, what it does, uh, how it works internally, uh, what it's good at, 
what it's uh, not so good at, uh, what I've been doing to it for GCC 11, and sort of ideas for what I'm going to do to it in the future. Uh, get to the next slide. Uh, oops, that's too many. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, an option I added in to GCC. I added in GCC 10. Um, Dash F Analyzer enables a new interprocedural pass here to the compiler that implements 15 new warnings. Um, and um, they, the new warnings kind of are all enabled together because this new analysis uh, pass is much more expensive than the kinds of analysis we've traditionally done inside the compiler. So there's sort of one big opt-in switch for the user to, uh, to opt to spend that cost um, sort of together. Um, the warnings all begin um, with dash W analyzer. And sort of the motivating case that I've been focused on was, has been um, double free detection. And, uh, and there are sort of a cluster of warnings related to um, memory management um, mistakes. So double freeze, use after freeze, freeing something that wasn't a heat pointer, and leaks of malloc pointers. And um, then uh, I track whether a malloc result for malloc call has been checked for null or not and see if null values or things that could be null because they haven't been checked yet has um, are um, could part could be dereferenced or could be passed to a function that uh, an argument that's been labeled as needing to be non-null um, similarly i do double f close detection and detection of leaks of uh, f opened file stars uh, which is a very similar sort of case, um, and some detection of stale um, stack frames. So I detect um, if a set jump call has been called into a um, set jump buffer, uh, effectively recording the program counter and other state into that jump buffer. And then you long later on, you do a long jump at some point after that stack frame in which the set jump call was done has has popped. And so that, that stack frame is, is gone away, and you would be restoring the program counter with a garbage value, which is obviously bad. Um, similarly, if you dereference a pointer that's pointing into a, a stack frame that has gone away, um, I have a detection. I have a list of functions that are known to be unsafe um, to be used inside a signal handler and detect if, um, uh, and basically looked, I don't, are we in a signal handler? Are they called? Warn about that. And I have a couple of very much just proof of concept um, warnings that relate to uh, it's, it's sort of a re-implementation of the idea from Perl of taint mode, where uh, data that's an untrusted data that hasn't been sanitized gets used. Um, for example, and then the example I have is if it uses an array index. And the other example, uh, the other one I have is an attempt to detect if a password gets leaked into a log file. But both of those last two are very much just a proof of concept. They 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 they're not really um, designed for um, full generality yet. So here's a simple example of some source code with a bug in it, uh, a, a trivial example where P is malloced and uh, Q is malloced, um, and we do some stuff with them, then we free P, and then we free, oops, we free P again rather than freeing Q. So a typo at line nine gives us a double free bug, and um, also a leak, because the analyzer warns about this. and. It warns, um, as well as just telling you you've got a double three at line nine, um, it detect it emits additional information showing the, the, the flow of control to get there. So it has these uh, events. So event one, there's a, here's the allocation. Event two, uh, the first three was here. And event three, the second three uh, was there. And, and here's a cross-reference to the other event. So you can see, oh, that's where the first three happened. And uh, and then there's, here's the second uh, warning about the leak, which is, says it was allocated here, and it leaks when the uh, queue goes out of scope at the end of the function. And this is, um, I mean, these are probably this is probably overkill for such trivial examples. But once you start getting into more complicated control flow, I think there needs to be a way for the user to 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 be informed of what the analyzer thinks going on. So I guess the question is, why add? static analysis to GCC. And my my answer is, well, the earlier a bug is found, the better. And what's the earliest place in which you can analyze code? Well, I'd say it's the compiler. Um, as the code is being written, as the developer is hacking on their code and, um, 
are making changes, they're compiling, they're debugging. Surely it's best to tell people up front. And I, if you were to measure how many how many warnings um, how many warnings fire on such and such a code base, and you sort of looked at GitHub or at a bit like all the packages in the distribution, I, the ideal is you would a warning would never show up in that because the warning would have already fired and no 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 bugs that the warning could 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 have detected would have leaked into patches or into tarballs or, or source trees. Yeah, you want to catch the bugs immediately as the code is being written, rather than say when some third-party analyzer runs, uh, which I, I which I've basically said there. And th and in order for that to work, the analyzer needs to have two properties. It needs to be fast enough that turning it on is a worthwhile trade-off. And my ballpark idea is, well, maybe if I double the compile time, is that an acceptable trade-off that people would opt in and say, yes, I'm willing to double my compile time to get to detect a whole bunch of certain badness. Um, and I, I don't know, I haven't achieved that yet, although in my, my latest version, um, the, the analyzer is not always the slowest pass anymore. And some optimization passes are now, uh, I'm actually faster than some of the optimization passes. Uh, but the other thing is that the signal to noise ratio, um, in terms of the output from the compiler, the, the analyzer needs to be sufficiently useful to the end user that they'll be willing to turn it on and, and wade through the results. So those are the sort of uh, two, two goals there. And, um, and the, I, I guess the other question is, well, why do this and add this to GCC? Clang Analyzer exists, and that kind of gets into, oh, well, why do we have two free open source tool chains? Um, well, we do, and competition between them, healthy competition, um, is good. Um, we sort of we we push each other forward, and we we have different ideas, and we can take the good ideas from each other. And I feel, well, the GNU project should have an analyzer. Why, why should Clang have all the fun? And um, so moving on to how it works internally. Um, a lot of analyzers uh, take this approach that, um, a lot of analysts take the approach that um, of, of modeling APIs using state machines. And I, I like this approach. It's the one I, I, I'm using in, in, inside this analyzer. Uh, so for example, for the malloc free API, if you see an allocation to a pointer from a, from a malloc call, you, you have a little state machine, you transition that particular value to an unchecked state, meaning this, ha this hasn't been checked yet, it could be null. And then later, if you see a conditional in which the pointer is checked, and on one edge of the control flow graph, you can transition that pointer to the known to be non-null state, and on the other, you trans transition it to the null state. And if you see a free call, you, you can transition the, that value into the freed state. But if, you're already, if it's already in the freed state, you can emit a, oh, we've got a double free warning. So it's quite a nice way of structuring an analyzer. It sort of makes things, it sort of separates the sort of analysis engine from the API checking um, aspect, uh, which is a nice sort of separation of concerns. And um, the, um, that's on the next slide. Yeah, so I have a, there's a diagram of the state machine for malloc and free that uh, I use inside the checker, which I, I, we don't have time to dwell on. But hopefully you get the idea of checking things via state machines. And, and so I looked at, well, let's focus on double free detection. And, and I've been sort of focusing on it's a 15 year old, the 2005 double free vulnerability in Kerberos. Uh, that's been, um, I, I've sort of been focusing on how can I detect that? And I thought, well, what's my minimum viable analyzer to, to de detect this vulnerability? And I tried, um, there's, a, there's an analyzer that was developed a, at Stanford that was eventually productized as Coverity. And I looked at one of the papers coming out of Stanford that talked about the implementation of the Stanford checker. And I looked at implementing that inside GCC. And unfortunately, my implementation sucked. Um, and the reason it, or the, the, one of the big problems with, with my implementation, uh, or that, that at least first prototype by me, um, not necessarily theirs, is um, my diagnostics were just inscrutable. It would say, there's a double free at this line of code. And I go, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Um, I, I am unconvinced. And, uh, and I find myself looking at the code and trying to convince myself, well, is my analyzer right or is it wrong? And thinking, well, I can't debug this. And how is the user supposed to 
um, understand this. So I felt I needed to focus on emitting control flow paths to the user to, to basically convince the user that um, what, that there is a problem, or at least to give the the user a sense of what is the analyzer thinking. Um, and th th I felt that that is a necessary um, component of a of a worthwhile solution in the space. Um, but the and the other aspect is as well as giving the user enough information to convince them that this is what the problem is, this is what the analyzer is thinking. It needs to not overwhelm them by being too ver verbose. Uh, unfortunately. I, my, my analyzer is still very verbose. I've been working on fixing that, but there, there's still room for improvement. And so the implementation works by building what's called an, an exploded graph. And this combines both control flow and state information. Uh, so it's a directed graph. And in each node within the directed graph, uh, each node is a program point and program state pair. And uh, this terminology I've borrowed or um, I'm abusing from a, a 1995 paper. And exactly what one stores in the state at each um, node in this graph uh, is a big design question. In that initial paper, they have, I think, very fine grained, um, basically just data flow facts about saying this, is the, this particular statement is true at this particular node in the graph and use that implication to it. In my implementation, I have much chunkier objects representing state. And there's a tension between do you, exactly what you model inside a state. You want state to be precise enough um, to avoid false positives. And you want to capture, for example, in the, the, the Kerberos double free bug I mentioned, you need to capture uh, some non-trivial state in order to, uh, you can't just do SSA, SSA names, and um, for example. and um, but anyway, you build this graph of of point of of nodes can contain both point and state information, and you and you basically explore the the routes through the graph, and if unexpected state happens, if you, a pointer is free that you already know to be freed at that um, within that state, you say it's a double free bug, and this is the same um, as I understand it, the same approach that the Clang analyzer uses internally. Uh, I'm waiting for the slide to appear. Uh, I see there's a lot of discussion on dash W error on the, um, and oh, I think the, there's an absolutely humongous, um, the complicated, oh no, um, slide, was that slide 15 or slide 16? Um, I can talk about, yes, yeah, soundness and completeness is a, um, oh yeah, so slide 15, I ha um, which took a long time to load on my, uh, yeah, is a is a fragment from GraphBiz of one of my graphs, and um, unfortunately, um, you these graphs get very very big and very very complicated very quickly. Uh, so this is just a fragment of um, one of the the, of it, the the graphs in GraphBiz, and I put my red dot on the entry point or just below it. There's sort of an entry point in gray, and then it goes into another node, and these nodes roughly correspond to basic blocks in the control flow graph, although I split them at um, suitably interesting places. So um, the, um, yeah, the, the red dot is the, uh, the, the presenter's mouse pointer. Um, so you, we sort of have a virtual laser pointer. Um, and um, the, uh, yeah, so the, these nodes roughly correspond to basic blocks, but I split them at calls and returns. And I, um, and also, in suitably interesting state changes. And because these get, get so, so complicated so quickly, uh, my, my trick I've come up with is to use colorization. So you see that it sort of starts off in a gray state and it goes in here and there's sort of a red and a blue and there's a lot of complicated control flow logic. And, uh, and so I have some sort of colors to draw the eye to, oh, this is where a malloc happened or this is where a free happened. That is where the, the interesting things happen uh, or interesting from, the point of view of the diagnostics. Um, traditionally, one talks about soundness and completeness when talking about static analysis tools. And um, there are, unfortunately, dif different communities have exactly opposite definitions of these. But basically, it's a way of talking about false positives and false negatives and, um, and whether you allow them. And my, my tool that can, can have both. Um, I, I, there are, for example, 
I merge states in order to keep the analysis um, tractable to help things terminate. And that's one way in which false positives can happen. And my states are, an, are, are an abstraction. They can uh, over approximate the, what the state the machine could actually be in. Um, and I under approximate in some ways as well. So there are some ways in which we can miss problems and some ways in which we can have false positives. Um, but hopefully I've chosen a pragmatic set of trade-offs to generate useful readable diagnostics. In terms of the integration within GCC, it works on the uh, Gimple SSA representation, which um, I chose basically because I wanted to, it to work well with LTO. I basically wanted to piggyback off that so that I can do link time analysis, if you will, so that if the malloc and free calls are hidden in one translation unit, and uh, maybe I, and I have a working demo of detecting a double free where a free happens in one source file and the second free is in a different source file. Uh, unfortunately, um, uh, that, that that has some scaling issues which I can talk about and how I plan to fix that. Um, doing it with Gimple SSA puts us at the mercy of optimization options that have already applied. There's an argument I should run it much earlier. The um, Clang analyzer works on the um, abstract syntax tree. Uh, and doing it with the Gimbal SSA it buys us some things, and I don't know quite know if I've made the right trade-off, but I, I'm, I'm, I don't plan to change that right now. The implementation is read-only. I build my exploded graph and store stuff inside it. Um, but I make I try not to I don't change anything in the in the GCC represent rest of the GCC's representation. I'm just generating what I need to generate warnings and then tearing all of that down and let GCC continue. I also assume that um, the garbage collector doesn't run. I and I so I reference um, GC managed objects and don't have proper routes for them. But um, that's just a simplification. How the how I, how the, the how does the analysis work? My algorithm is well. First, I build this exploded graph, and to do that, I have a work list, which is a priority queue of of nodes of these point and state pairs, and I um, I populate it by um, starting with all of the entry points, the public entry points, um, into the the source file. Uh, the priority queue is has a sorting function on it that has various properties and one of the things it does is it tries to keep program um, uh, nodes that are at the same program point together so that we can do state merging uh, and um, I basically attempt to help the analysis converge and so having built this work list um, or at least the initial version of the work list we process it we pull nodes off the front and um, and for each point state node, we process it and determine well, what happens next. Uh, what are the success? What's the successor node um, point state pair or pairs if you have a branching point in control flow, and add those to the work list. And possibly you've got a, you hit a node that already exists in the in the graph, and we add an edge, we get a cache hit, or we add new ones. And ideally, we get to a point of convergence where all of the nodes we're processing or and where all the successor nodes already exist and we successfully drain the work list and we've fully explored the sort of the, the point state graph of, of the program um, but that can fail in various ways um, there can be uh, pathological uh, explosions of state uh, i have a bunch of logic to help loops terminate and converge quickly but my code has bugs and so I have a couple of safety limits. There's a per, per, per program point limit where if there are too many states at a given program point, I just give up at that program point and don't add any more nodes there and uh, hope that the rest of the, the graph, um, it, uh, well, that's stop exploring that and hope we get the diagnostics that way. And at some point, um, there's an overall limit on the number of nodes in the graph that scales up based on the number of basic blocks in the source file, and that's the other sort of safety limit for if my state management code has failed. So we explore the graph, we we build it, these this directed graph, and we save di and any diagnostics. For example, we find a double free bug. We don't emit them yet. We save them into the into the nodes in the graph where they they happen, and that way I can do deduplication because a particular diagnostic can fire in on several different paths, 
and I try and then group together those diagnostics. I sort of partition them and decide that these, these separate diagnostics are actually the same thing. And then for each of those deduplicated diagnostics, I try and pick, well, what's the best one to emit? And the way I do that is I look at the paths through the exploded graph and find the shortest feasible one um, within each partition uh, to reach a, um, uh, a node. And um, uh, feasible in the sense of the, the conditions along the path. I, I don't want, you don't want a, a flag to be true along one edge and then decide that that same flag is false along a different edge. And um, I'm probably getting the five minute warning, yes. Um, and uh, and, and I, I have an approximation of finding the shortest feasible path. Um, so I, um, which is another place in which false positives and false negatives can occur, but it kind of works. And then within each, um, and then then I'm I've ready to then I have a, a uh, I've given a deduplicated diagnostic and a path through the the graph to get there. I build a list of events along that path that I'm going to report to the user that describe what happens. And uh, because I'm I guess I'm a compiler engineer, uh, I then I have a, a peephole optimizer that I apply on this list of events to try and find well what are redundant what don't what don't matter what and uh, and i eliminate things i'm sort of optimizing for readability if you will and finally emit the diagnostic and the events along the the, the events for the diagnostic and there are these precision of wording hooks that each diagnostic can describe the events um, in ways that make sense for that diagnostic so if you have a use after free you talk about well dif different different events matter for different diagnostics so we want to emphasize them and describe them in different ways and and then so that's sort of how the algorithm works but then there's how do i track state and i found that just yeah as i said, said earlier just just doing it for ssa names wasn't good enough um you because you can stash stuff through pointers so on and so forth c is hard um, and tracking, st simulating the state of a C program is difficult. There are arbitrary pointers, there's casts and unions and so on. And, um, and so I have, I, I abstract my state in, a, in several ways. I have a, a hierarchy of abstract regions, of symbolic regions. So you might start with a region representing uh, the stack and then within that a region representing a frame of a function, within that a frame of uh, a local array within that, that frame. And then with that, a specific element within the array. Uh, so there's a sort of concept of symbolic regions. And then parallel to that, there's a concept of symbolic values, which might be constants, or it might be the initial value of a particular region, say the, the referencing the, an input pointer and getting to its, that particular field at the beginning of the path, it had this initial value. And there are symbolic values representing pointers to specific symbolic regions. And, and then various other ones. And one particular one is the unknown symbolic value, which is where we, we're just giving up, uh, which happens if the symbolic values get too complicated or at certain merge points. Uh, it can be thought of as sort of the bottom value, the lattice, if you will. And so my program state objects have four parts. There's the store, which sort of binds regions to values. It's not a simple, of course, it's some, somewhat more complicated than that because I have logic for handling aliasing. There's a set of constraints along the path. So we might know that, for example, the initial value of a particular parameter P was non-null. Um, we might, we also store the, the shape of the stack. And um, finally, there are the state machine states I talked about earlier that we might know that the initial value of P is the result of a malloc that we haven't checked yet. Or we also have global states. For example, the signal handler, it doesn't, it stores its states globally rather than per value. Like it, it's basically a giant flag saying, are we on a signal handler or not? And so the current status, unfortunately, it's really just experimental, the version in GCC 10 and indeed still in trunk and for C only, very much for early adopters only. But it has found, it, it has found a vulnerability in open SSL of all places. Uh, I believe in null pointer dereference and error handling and some bugs and else utils. Though I believe in both cases, a lot of false positives had to be waded through. Uh, it also, for what it's worth, it also found a, a lot of memory allocation bugs in the CTS. So thank you very much. 
<laughs> oh, wonderful. I'm, I'm glad it's useful. As I, so as I said, oh, we're running out of time. Um, strength and limitations, uh, yeah. The, um, the, I have a, I have an implementation of cool summarization to try and avoid exponential explosion, and that's really just a placeholder, and I need to improve that. The um, And I have my cute ASCII art showing into procedural control flow, but it's too verbose and can overwhelm the user. The implementation of state track in GCC 10, I had at least two major design flaws, um, which led to explosions of state where things really ought to have been merged but weren't. I have about two months left of GCC 11 feature work. So far, I've landed a big rewrite of how I track state about a week and a half ago that fixes those two issues. But state explosions can still happen. So I'm working on that. And so basically, what I'm focusing on is scaling up um, things to work on real world C code rather than toy examples and, and fix the ludicrously verbose examples where yeah the, the Kerberos double free bug was 1200 lines of standard error uh, it's now down to 57 and I'm, there's clearly room for improvement um, and generalizing to not just be malloc free to other things C++ support uh, for example I'm missing exception handling and lots of other ideas uh, for example, given that this is um, LPC, I'd love to add kernel support, probably by plugin. So, for example, detecting user space versus kernel space pointers and kernel space pointers leaking in ways to user space that they shouldn't. And if, for example, you disable interrupts in a driver and forget to re-enable them on one of the exit parts, if there are any kernel developers listening, I don't really know kernel code, but that might be a fun thing to hack on once I've stabilized the core and got it more stable. So that is my talk and um, thank you very much for listening and thank you very much to lpc for hosting the gnu um the gnu track and i don't i probably don't have any time for questions i'm afraid or at least minimal time before the next uh, session uh, starts i see there's been a lot of chat which i'm afraid i've been largely ignoring as i've been trying to get through my slides so quickly um but yeah the the uh, uh if i can navigate to the slide. The project homepage is on the GCC wiki. So um, yeah, as I say, future plans. I'm trying to pick slide 35, but I, I seem to keep debouncing backwards and forwards through it. Um, all right. Uh, so we, yeah, we're at, the, we're at the time. And yeah. Um, yeah, we could follow up in a hack room. Um, yes, um, that would be good. Um, I don't know which hack room is available. Um, oh, Alana is saying we can continue here. Yeah, um, you, you uh, can just stay in this room. Well, There's right not there, so, yeah. Okay, uh, well, that's great if we can. Um, I've, because there is no subsequent uh, session in this room. Okay, I, I didn't get that. Um, if that's okay, or am I being kicked out? <laughs> no, David, you, 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 you can carry on. We, we, um, we tried to finish half an hour before the deadline for the benefit of our European members, um, but um, uh, so, so as not to keep them too late. Um, and I should note that the chat is will be captured and put the website and uh, linked to the wiki so that you can um, up later with all the questions that have come in. But Wonderful. you've got a bit of time now to, to follow up. Mm. I'm uh, scrolling back through the chat, I'm afraid. Uh, <laughs> where are we? Um, I have a question. Hmm. Um, is there something here that um, it could be leveraged somehow to from to be used from some of the backends in the compiler? Um, like, for example, the analysis engine, the state machines, and everything? Because I'm thinking about, you know, in the BPF backend, you know that the kernel, it has a verifier. Basically, it tries to verify, well, it verifies the BPF program that you uh, mm. load in the kernel. Mm. And then it does some kind of a static analysis and tries mm. to verify if there are loops. Um, well, there are many, many other things. It tracks how the registers are used. It tracks, you know, like which register contain the frame pointer value and things like that. Now it does it, of course, at the level of the BPF program, which at the end it means it's at the level of the generated program. But I was wondering, I mean, sometimes I fantasize like, well, what if you could use, you know, what if GCC could tell you, you know, if the hmm. 
BPF program that you are compiling from C is actually be uh, acceptable for the kernel verifier or not? Right. I, I, I don't know enough about BPF to, to, to give a good answer to that, I'm afraid. I, as I understand that the questions that BPF cares about, or the verifier cares about, relates to ensuring loops. I don't even know if BPF supports loops, but it basically they're little mi 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 mini functions that run inside a kernel uh, interpreter, right? Or a, or a JIT, I don't know, yeah. So it needs to be sufficiently simple um, uh, where, and exactly what that definition of sufficiently simple means, I, I don't know enough. I fear that the these are sort of questions that affect the sort of RTL level rather than the GIMPL level. Yes, yes, so yes. But it, might, it might be that my analyzer is running too, too early um, to be useful, but I am, I may not be the right person to, well, I'm not my analyzer, but I, I guess I would need to learn more about BPF to, 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 to give a good answer. So, sorry. Okay. Well, I was just wondering. Thanks. Mm. Any other questions or anyone who knows more about BPF who can um, enlighten me or lighten? Um, I did. Can you hear me? Yes. Ah. ah. <laughs> well, uh, great talk. Uh, I was just curious. So much, by the way. Sorry. <laughs> Take your time, no rush. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask if you know if there are uh, around the integrations for your analyzer with IDEs or editors, because your kind of output with different oh. steps, it mm -hmm. really looks uh, to me something that would be nice to have in the editor. Yeah. Um, so in terms of output formats, um, the the GCC has a dash F diagnostic output format equals, and I missed some dashes in there, um, equals JSON that I added in GCC nine, I think, and um, and that supports that does emit path information for diagnostics that have that, and it's my own or our own sort of um, JSON, GCC specific JSON format that supports exactly what GCC's diagnostic um, um, in, internal GCC diagnostics supports. Um, years ago, I was playing around with static analysis in of just trying to analyze Fedora and sort of consolidate results, and I came up with a format called Firehose that was a sort of way of aggregating Clang analyzer results. GCC warnings um, and other checkers, um, and and I got some and I've got some sort of packages for working with that and sort of consuming results from different checkers, um, and there is a and there is a format called Serif S A R I F that is, I think, going through standardization within um, uh, Oasis, uh, and that, I think that effort was originated within Microsoft and the Clang analyzer. I believe supports outputting in that format, um, and unfortunately, the spec is a several hundred page word file, um, which sort of put me off it. I don't know if there are any. Um, and it, I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess it'd be nice to support output that as an output format for GCC, um, because it captures. It, I mean, it's got a very rich data model for capturing things like multi-threaded. Um, yeah. analysis where you're sort of detecting not just here's here's the flow of control that leads to the point it's like here's the flow of control on thread one and then on thread two here's a different thread flow of control um and sort of so it's got a very rich data model uh, capturing that in in json form um i what i'd really like to see is a free or open source um what am i looking for a validator to check that if I spit stuff out in that format, it's um, it, I'm actually spitting out the correct format because uh, I think only Visual Studio Code. Well, I think the Microsoft tools can consume it, um, and um, for I mean, I, well, I don't, I, I'm not going to be rude about that. I, I'm an Emacs user. <laughs> 
Yeah, so you're planning to implement this new format or you want to stick uh, to the current JSON one? Um, I, I, I mean, this is what I would say, patches are welcome. And I think I even suggested, <laughs> no, no. Uh, I suggested <laughs> it as a summary of code project because it's quite, it's kind of quite nicely self-contained and also because I don't want to do it. Okay. <laughs> Should okay. I say that out loud? Um, or at least it's, okay. it, it's a big, yeah. Uh, the, but yeah, the existing J, J, GCC JSON output format that I added in GCC nine does it does capture all this path information. Um, yeah. So you so you don't need to you don't need to parse by silly ASCII. No, 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 I was asking because format. because I implemented in Emacs um, like an initial implementation that it's your JSON thing and uh, does Ooh. a step by step uh, into the code. So yeah, I, it's still an initial implementation, but I wanted to ask if you are planning to change to something more rich or uh, you're going to stick with that. Uh, it, it captures, um, it, I believe it captures all I need. Um, I might add flags to it, but um, okay. if, and if you've got, if you've got um, code, I can, if there's an Emacs extension, I can. Uh... Yes, yes, uh, I have it. Ooh. The thing is that we should maybe integrate it with some existing package uh, mm -hmm. uh, to invoke the build system because at the moment I think it's just eating the JSON file. Yeah. By the way, if you are interested, uh, interested uh, yeah, I can send I, it to you. If, if I may be a bit cheeky, um, if I have the ear of an Emacs hacker, um, but uh, I have a long-standing RFE against Emacs, which is that um, GCC can now, you, and, you, and you know we added um, support for fix-it hints to GCC. Um, it's, it's been in GCC for some years now, um, which are these little are like, okay, you misspelled this, so you should have typed this. Um, there is a machine-readable output format for that, um, and that is stuck, uh, I think, I, and I can't find the URL. I'll have to dig that out later because um, I would love that to, um, I, I want a magic please fix this button in Emacs that I can press on my compiler warnings. Um, and almost all of the support is there. Um, we just need GCC and Emacs to talk to each other. So uh, Emacs is not passing correctly the warning. Uh, um, well, there's a, there's a, I think, dash F diagnostics, I don't even know. It's something fix it hints, um, and we stole the format from Clang because Clang ah, okay. added this um, output format and option and output format. So I faithfully re-implemented it, um, mm. and I'm not. And I think I think what happened. Anyway, so I mean, this is wildly off topic for. Um, the, <laughs> oh, it's for interesting. The, Probably there is the, some regex yeah, to fix is, uh, somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if I can, yeah. Uh, well, I can have a look. Yeah, uh, part of, actually, <laughs> I think what it was was relates to the encoding of um, the column numbering. Um, column numbering in diagnostics is a nightmare because what is what do you mean by a column number? For the longest time, GCC meant um, the column number was a one-based offset in bytes within the current source file which is a bizarre thing to you think it, if you were counting bytes from the start of the line it would be yes. zero based but it's one Not based really as well. and and in gcc 10 or is it 11 uh um and i'm oh no i'm blanking on his name sorry um we have we've we uh, we've got we've patched the duck we've got some new options for saying well if you have tab characters that's actually do you want to expand them and you want to be zero and also what happens if you have there are some unicode code points where the standard recommends that if you're in a monospaced font how many columns they should occupy so that smileys and various emojis can take up two columns in a monospaced thing and it's like what does that mean if you have yes, it's an right, emoji right. in a string literal and in your in your UTF-8 encoded C source file, um, what is the column number if you then have a warning later on in that source line? Um, and and we we have our, we have we have new options for that in GCC 11 coming up. 
Um, so I think, yeah, I need to have more of a discussion between GCC and Emacs about uh, getting fix it hints working. So yeah, my yeah. dream is that the compiler buffer, I can click on a warning and have Emacs. Yeah. GCC is supplying the, a suggested fix. I want Emacs yes. to be able to auto apply that's, it. That's how it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, and this is why we off topic. I apologize to everybody. <laughs> no problem. Thanks. Nick, you're. Yeah, sorry, I was having some audio issues uh, also after machine reboot, but uh, huge fan of this work. It's it's really cool stuff. As an LLVM and client developer, I'm super jealous of it. Um, you know, my my interest really is in static analysis and uh, at least being able to use Clang's static analyzer on the kernel requires being able to build the kernel itself with Clang, which unfortunately is more than a full-time job. <laughs> so I've been distracted with that, but um, very, very cool stuff. Um, yeah. you know, we're, we're just in the process now of wiring up kind of Clang Tidy, uh, which for us has been like a good, like so, certain code bases want to have like warnings specific just to their code base and aren't generally specific to any given C code base. But um, I, I think uh, like one of the ideas for kernel ideas, so the only check that we have implemented right now, like now that we have the infrastructure wired up, we want to go and actually start writing these kernel specific checks. And mm -hmm. the one that we have so far is, uh, there's like a kernel interface like where um, you, can in, you can encode error information in functions that return pointers. So there's this error putter kind of macro check where the caller is expected to check, you know, is there a, uh, was there an error encoded in this pointer return value or not? And, um, you know, if I run this on an ARM64 def config right now, it, it spots at least three cases in the kernel that we have to go fix. Like we literally just wired this up last week. So mm. haven't had time to fix them yet. But nice. um, that, I think that's that's a good idea for, for you know, a kernel specific check um, mm. to check for that. Um, but Can I, does that, does that, so that runs as part of, are you saying Clang tidy? Oh, yeah, so that it doesn't it doesn't run as part of the Clang invocation. Um, mm. So, uh, like Clang has the ability to build a control flow graph, but for performance mm. reasons, generally does not. Um, mm. And so, it's it's an external tool that's separate. It depends on being able to generate a compile commands.json. So, we have Python script in the kernel that parses the uh, I forget what the name of those files are called. They're like .cmd files. I think there's like a dash capital M D flag that oh the dependency yeah. information. Yep. So yeah. so we, we parse those to generate a compile commands at JSON. Yeah. You know, I've used yeah. bear to hook make before for this as well, mm -hmm. kind of thing. But mm -hmm. um it, it at, at least a lot of the client tooling seems to depend on having that information available yeah. first. But, and it sounds like that particular checker is working at the level of the abstract syntax tree uh, of, of finding the Rather than the, as you say, well, rather than the control flow graph. In, in Clang Tidy, you have access to all of the classes within Clang, so mm -hmm. um, it it's possible to say like generate me the control flow graph of this. So it, it's mm -hmm. not strictly just the AST. It's no, more it's... of at compile time, we generally don't have the control flow graph. Or mm -hmm. one of the things that's very tricky with the architecture of LOVM is when we start doing optimizations. Like once we've identified maybe there's a bug or something. In LLVM, we've typically discarded the the front end information. Is we've we've had this loss of fidelity. We don't really know what the front end language was anymore. So it's mm -hmm. very difficult for us to map back and say like, well, here's the source line and column that that this came from, right? So, mm -hmm. so I think that's the strength that that GCC has that lends itself well to this kind of analysis. That's very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I guess the only other thought that I have about, um, sorry, I don't know if I'm unmuted or not. I can hear you. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah, my UI shows that it's, okay, there we go, now it's working. Um, yeah, I guess the other thing I'm curious about is like for some of these reports, um, like even when I've gone in to try to triage these, right, is, you know, now we have the reporting framework, now we need firemen firefighters to go in and, and, and triage these, right? Um, yeah. And one of the things I find difficult is when some of these analysis reports um, have like more than 10 steps to follow, <laughs> yeah. like over 100, like they get insanely hard to follow, right? So like mm -hmm. the CV you mentioned, it was already like very, very long. 
right? Yeah. Kind of thing. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so I think that that's my only piece of feedback is like for the people that that need to go in and review these when you start reporting them, um, like whatever you can do to really trim them down it goes goes a long, long way. Mm, yeah. I, I I generally try to like clang the static analyzer can dump HTML, which which is helpful, and then I try to sort that by how long the reporting chain is and start yeah. with. I, I usually find that things that it's only one or two nodes are usually feel relatively precise. Things that are like hundreds and hundreds of cases start making, um, uh, start to have assumptions where I'm not sure that they're always correct, you know, yeah. all the way through the chain, which is tricky. Mm. Mm. Yeah, the sorting by path length is um, it is yeah. There's a there's a paper I, I think I linked to it on my um, slides. A retrospective from the uh, uh, the the from Coverity on their um, how they looked at thing, and it was like the yeah. If you at a certain level, if the if the, if the yeah, it's from there a few billion lines of code later, um, where. Um, it's like, yeah, if, if the path's too long, is the developer ever going to read it? Um, the focus on the shorter, simpler ones um, to get um, results. Um, yeah, and it also has the really despondent view on how if the C language doesn't exist. Um, you, a standard is just a pile of pile of paper, and all that people code to is what the compiler accepts, um, which is a rather fatalistic view of language standards, but sadly, possibly true. Uh, where are we? Yeah. Any? Uh, I should probably look through the. Yeah. Um, there lots of discussion of dash w error, which yeah. <laughs> um, Yes, yeah, so there's some discussion and was in the chat about dealing with um, directed graphs, I guess. Um, anyone have any <laughs> good tools for dealing with directed graphs? I use xdot, uh, which is a Python-based viewer for uh, graph viz. Um, if anyone has uh, suggestions. Um, I guess the other thing is um, one one thing that PyPy project. Well, if I've got a bunch of GCC developers in the room, the PyPy project, um, they have a built-in OpenGL-based viewer inside their compiler uh, that lets you sort of zoom around, sort of in debug mode, bring up graphs and zoom around them and zoom in and click and basically browse the data structures. Did we ever have anything like that in GCC? And should we? Well. I guess the same question would go to uh, the LLVM developers in the room. I, I think all we have is the option to, to emit the dot and dot files for, mm. for graphs of, of CFG. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I just find that when I'm debugging the compiler, there's a sort of, a, OK, I, I dump all that out. And then it's like, well, if as I'm stepping through the code, it's like, well, I'd really like a dump focusing on this aspect. And it got me thinking that. Um, and it got me sort of reminiscing about PyPy, which has, has a wonderful interactive uh, graph um, 
explorer where you can just click on things and you can sort of click on nodes and then you sort of drop back into the interactive session. Okay, tell me about the node I just clicked on. Uh, yeah, I can dream, I guess. <laughs> but I suspect adding OpenGL as a dependency to GCC would be frowned upon. Going through the notes. Okay, so David, do you want to expand on anything else? I uh, know. I, I, I was. Uh, I guess we're we're finishing. We're we're done. I'm. Uh, so there's nothing more in this uh, on this track, is there? So uh, I better get back to Bugzilla. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so if there are no more questions or mm -hmm. anything, so let's finish the track for today. Mm -hmm. And well, thank you to all the presenters and see you tomorrow around here.